Yeah, I don't know. I don't really. Yeah. I, I can't stand energy drinks. This is like the only one you'll ever see me drink. Like oh my god. There's like no amazing. sugar. So there's just caffeine. Like it's, I don't know. It's they give like me. Weird they give me. Like <laughs> when I sit here, I'm just like, why am I drinking? Like, I can't sit still. I have to. But I try to stay away from the food. Because I don't know. Like, I don't know. My body makes me sad. I just have to get it. But. Yeah, I'm not a Okay. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Yeah, I love this one. It's fun. And you can get that jacket next door. Yes. Actually, yeah. I was just about to say. Yeah. See. Yeah. There are clearance. They make cute. Yeah. Are you able to wear that like in a? Because I like I know she's wearing the jacket because I was eating. I don't want to. Every wear facility wear is going to have a different dress code, so you would want to check what, and you don't know exactly where you're going to be working. But I wear this not just with scrubs. I wear it just because I like the jacket. Yeah, I'm. I think it's cute. Yes. All right. Yay! I think we're ready to go. I'm late. Sorry, YouTube world. I know I'm a little late today. So happy Monday. Does anybody have any questions on what you're, you know, you're reading, the homework that you did, the stuff that we went over last week? Anybody have any questions on anything? I would say I did, I did the wrong homework. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. Um, let me go ahead and get your scores. This is going to be for chapters two and three. I do have one question. Chapter three, have one question. Okay. All right. So when I call your name, let me know what scores you got or how many you got wrong. And uh, if you didn't get to it, just say pass. And I'll ask you again on Wednesday. I just, anytime I have blanks, I just keep asking you until I get them filled in. No pressure. Kendra. Kendra not here. Lashadra. Um chapter two I got hundred and chapter three I got eighty-five. Thank you. Sehar? Um chapter two I got a hundred and chapter three I got an eighty. Thank you. Korea. Chelsea. Chapter two I had hundred. Chapter three I had ninety-five. Thank you. Catherine? Chapter two, I had 100, and chapter three, I had 90. Thank you. Jordan? Uh, chapter two, I got 100, and chapter three, I got a 90. Very good. Megan? Uh, chapter two, I got a 95, and chapter three, I got 100. Thank you. Tanaya? Aaliyah? Uh, chapter two, I got an 85, and chapter three, I got a 95. Thank you. Ricky? Chapter two, I got a 95, chapter three, I got 100. Thank you, Lori. Uh, chapter two, I got a hundred. Chapter three, I got a ninety. Thank you, Nadine. Jasmine. Oh, wrong homework. I, I That's fine. Um, no problem, Jamie. I got a hundred on both. Thank you. All right, I see that um, several of you had some um, difficulty on chapter three. You missed a couple questions, so let's go over the questions that you missed, so I can make sure that you understand. The right information. So, what are some of the questions you guys missed on chapter three? I missed six. Okay. Mm -hmm. I missed eight. So let me go. Yeah, use, let, let's do six first, and then we'll go to eight. So, on chapter three, so this is page one eighty three, number six. Which of the following is not an example of advanced directives? And this really gets students kind of mixed up. I have an entire lesson on advanced directives in the online course. So there's a whole lesson on nothing but advanced directives. So you can always, because you have access to the online course, you can go in and watch that lesson. And a picture really is worth a thousand words. So it, it'll kind of help demystify it. But let me explain briefly what the difference is. Okay. So let's say that me real me, the one standing here, me, 
um, it has to go to the hospital. I have chest pain, I'm not feeling well, I have to go to the hospital. Um, they're going to ask me what I want done if I can't answer questions. Like if, if I take a turn for the worse and I'm not able to answer any questions, what would I want done? Does that make sense? Because ultimately, I'm the best person to make decisions for me. Right? I know what I want. So they're probably going to ask me, you know, if you should go into a coma, what do you want us to do with you? Make sense? Right? Do, we, do you want CPR? Do you want a ventilator? And it really kind of depends on what I'm there for. Right? Well, like, if I know... Good morning. Good morning. If I know I have cancer and there's no cure for the cancer, doing CPR and putting me on a ventilator, that's really not going to solve anything, right? So I may make the decision that that's really not what I want to do. If I'm there for uh, chest pain and I'm having a heart attack, but I know that modern medicine does really good with that. Yeah, give me everything. Give me the best possible option. And then we'll see how it all comes out in the wash. Make sense? So one situation, I may say, I don't want any, any heroic measures. The other situation, I may say, I want everything. But I'm the one that gets to make that decision because it's my body. Now, if I'm thinking ahead... I can write these things down. If I have cancer, don't do anything, you know, and it's terminal and you can't fix it. Don't do anything. But if it's something that might be fixable, I want everything. I could write that down. That way, if I can't talk, somebody somewhere can read it. Good. That is a living will. Writing down my wishes ahead of time to tell people what I would want done is a living will. Good? Okay. Now, it's not going to cover everything, though. It just covered two possible scenarios, terminal cancer and heart attack. Didn't really cover everything. And I might have a car accident or a meteor may fall on me, and that's not covered. <laughs> what do you want us to do? Well, if it's not in my living will and I can't, tell them what I would want, I can appoint somebody to speak for me. Now, in my case, it's going to be my husband. He knows me better than anybody else. So I can have a health care surrogate, or it's also called a power of attorney health care, that basically says, hey, if you've got any questions that I can't answer them, go to him. He can speak for me, and it's just like me speaking for myself. Now, the law kind of gives spouses this ability, but it's not all-encompassing. A power of attorney is. Okay, the law, because it's your spouse, is going to send doctors to my husband. But if my mom says, uh-uh, oh, oh, wait, hold up, right, I got a different idea well, now they're fighting and the law doesn't really, um, it, it's a gray area, right? But a power of attorney is legal. So if I don't have a power of attorney, my husband and my mom can fight. If I do have a power of attorney for my husband, so he can speak for me, doesn't matter what my mom has to say. My husband is going to speak for me. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. So a living will is me writing down what I would want ahead of time. A power of attorney, or sometimes you'll hear it called a healthcare surrogate, is me appointing somebody to speak for me if I can't. Good? Questions? Now, there's one more called a do not resuscitate, or DNR. DNRs are legal documents that only go into effect... When the patient is dying from something that we know is going to kill them. So it's very, very specific. So let's say I have cancer and it's inoperable. They can't fix it. There's no treatment for it. We're very sorry, but there's nothing we can do, right? Sad day, certainly. Well, 
CPR is not like a video game. Okay, when you die in a video game and you come back, you come back with full life. <laughs> CPR doesn't do that for you. When CPR is done, we're bringing back the body that has the problems that killed it the first time. So if we don't have a way to solve that problem, bringing somebody back doesn't really do them any good. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So in some cases, when we have a condition that can't be treated effectively, that is going to end their life, then the doctor will sit down with them and say, hey, listen, there's nothing we can do. When this does kill you and it's going to your terminal, what do you want done? Do you want CPR and be put on a ventilator and a feeding tube and all that? Or do you just want to go naturally? Your choice. Your choice. But remember, CPR and ventilator and feeding tube isn't going to fix whatever's wrong with you. So when the doctors sit down and have that very difficult conversation with the families and the patients, and the patient says, no, I would just rather go peaceful, nothing, you know, don't do anything. Then the doctor will write out an order called a do not resuscitate. It says, basically, patient has a terminal condition. They don't want any heroic measures. Once they pass, let them go naturally. It just tells us what to do. CPR, no CPR. But remember I said that it only goes into effect when the patient dies of an expected event. So if I've got terminal cancer and I have a DNR, but I'm in a car accident, that car accident has no bearing on the DNR. None. Because the car accident is not the expected event. I may have a couple of weeks or months left in me that I need to make my final arrangements and say my goodbyes and all of that. So DNRs is not do not treat. It's not do not address emergencies. It's do not resuscitate when the patient dies from what we know is going to kill them, but only that. Does that make sense? Okay, so three different types of advanced directives. Living will, me writing down what I want. Power of attorney, healthcare, or healthcare surrogate, you'll hear it called two things. That's if I appoint somebody to be my legal representative if I can't speak. Or a do not resuscitate, which is a doctor's order that tells us what to do when the patient dies of an expected event. Good? Make sense? Um, so what about choking on something? That's it. That is an emergency. Okay. And DNRs are not affected by emergencies. They do not go into effect for choking. No. So if the patient is choking, we should be doing the Heimlich on them. Okay. Good. Patient has a heart attack. We should be treating it. If the patient falls down and goes boom and breaks a hip, we need to, you know, get them out of pain and decide whether surgery is indicated or not. Right. But we're not just going to, if they fall down, go boom, break a hip. We're not going to leave them on the floor and go, okay, good luck. <laughs> See ya. And that, that's not really our response here. But unfortunately, a lot of people are very confused out there about DNRs. And they think a DNR means, you know, put them in a dark corner, let them die. We're not going to treat anything. That is not what a DNR is. And that's actually neglect, which is a legal principle. <laughs> Okay, so number six, which of the following is not an example of advanced directives? Your choices are resident rights, living will, do not resuscitate, or durable power of attorney for health care. Well, we know a living will is me writing down my wishes. We know a DNR or do not resuscitate is a doctor's order. And we know that a power of attorney health care is me appointing somebody to speak on my behalf. Resident rights is not a form of advanced directives. Resident rights are granted to everybody. Okay, good? Yep. So that's six. Somebody else said eight? Mm -hmm. Okay, so eight. What is not involved in post-mortem care? Post-mortem care, uh, chapter three told you, was um, care after death. Okay, 
So basically, if somebody dies in our facility, we don't want to hand the um, funeral home a body that's not in good condition, right? If we're going to send them out, we want to send them out the best possible way we can. So we want to make sure that they're clean, that they have clean gowns on, that they, um, you know, are kind of ready for the families to be able to say their goodbyes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we would want post-mortem care, we would want to bathe the body, probably comb the hair. I would uh, make sure that the mouth is cleaned out because sometimes there's secretions, you know, from mouth breathing. And um, I would want to make sure that um, I'm sending the patient out in the best possible state. Remember, this is the last time anybody's really going to care for them. So you've really got to make this special. Okay. It's not a hurry up, get it done, get them out the door type thing. This really needs to be done with a little bit of reverence because we are the last people that are going to care. Emphasis on care for this body. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So post-mortem care is going to involve um, bathing the body, positioning them on their back. You don't want them on their side because they will, over time, it takes about 12 to 14 hours, but over time they will start to stiffen up as those ions leak from the muscles. It's not immediate. I know cartoons told us, you know, patients die, they just kind of fall over, go flat, and a uh, flower sticks up. It doesn't work like that. Um, and we can close their eyes because sometimes, you know, eyes are... are controlled by muscles. And once we're dead, the muscles don't work. Sometimes the eyes will open a little bit. So you can close those eyes very gently. That's okay. But it's not our job to notify the family. That's not us. That's the doctor's job. Doctor or, or RN. the RN. Yep. Either one of those, but that's not the CNA's job. Okay. We don't have to have those difficult conversations right i know when people get to that stage they go into is the hospice um, so not everybody not everybody not, so we would i would probably encounter that one day possibly yeah okay. so in a in a facility so hot let me back up real quick let's talk about hospice real quick hospice cares for terminally ill patients wherever they are where they live hospice isn't a place you go to die Hospice comes to you to care for you wherever you're at, at the end of your life. So hospice services can be done at home. They can be done at an assisted living facility where the patient lives. Hospice can be done in nursing homes where the patient lives. Hospice can be done in jails where the patient lives. So hospice isn't a place you go, although some hospices have facilities that you can go to if you have no other place to be, okay? Because sometimes families are like, no, nope, I'm not taking care of dad. He's not coming back here. I'm not going to have him die in my house. No, 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 no. Well, those people have to have a place to go. So that's what a hospice center is. It's for some people that have no other options. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you're working in a nursing home, you may be doing post-mortem care because hospice isn't usually round the clock. So if the patient dies and there's no hospice member there, you may be asked to do post-mortem care. Or if we have a patient that's lived in the nursing home for the last 13 years with dementia, but they weren't really any, you know, anywhere near dying, they just died from a heart attack one day, you know, you may be asked to do post mortem care because hospice wasn't involved. Make sense? Good. So as CNAs, we have to be aware of how to do post mortem care. Um, you know, because we may. Um, but understand that if hospice is there and involved, they'll probably take over that. Now, most people aren't comfortable with post mortem care, mortem care right out of the gate. Okay. You're probably going, uh, no, <laughs> not me. If you are not comfortable with post-mortem care, nobody's going to force you to do it. But they will probably ask you to accompany them while they do. So that you can get comfortable with it and learn what, what needs to be done. 
Okay. Good. Any questions on that? What other questions did you have on three? Sorry, it was, a, it was about eight. So say, say a facility does have you call the family after their family member passes. Is that like, I get in trouble for it? Like, well, follow your facility policy. And if a, remember, you're a nursing assistant, uh -huh. so nurses can delegate. Okay. Just making sure. Um, it's appropriate as far as delegation goes. Mm -hmm. But if you call me up, if, okay, so I'll give you an example. Let's say my aunt is in an assisted living facility across the street. Okay. My aunt is there. She needs a little help, but she's doing okay, you know. She's on medications, but she goes to the ice cream parlor on site and plays shuffleboard once a week and does puzzles in the activity room. She's nowhere near dying, mm -hmm. even though she's 92, right? So if you call me up and say, hey, your Aunt Betty, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, your Aunt Betty passed away last night. I'm going to have a million questions for you. Because Aunt Betty was fine on Tuesday. And that's really nice. Yeah, what happened? Why is Aunt Betty now gone, right? So that's why CNAs generally don't make those phone calls. Because, yes, you can say, I'm very sorry to inform you, your family member has passed, but you can't answer all the questions that are going to follow that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in most cases, that's not going to be your responsibility. Any other questions on Chapter 3? No, I just want to say this. I know I feel like I know personally for me, like when you say when you see like the big words like not or like except like you think I uh, you want to think like what it would be if it didn't say not. Like, right. So you, the best way if you have a question that has not or all of the following except then you as you read the question, you have to put the each answer in and figure out is it a yes or a no? Because you're looking for the yes. There's going to be three no's and you're looking for a yes. So let me show you how to do that. So let's go back to six. Which of the following is not an example of advanced directives? So there's one of those backwards questions, not. Right? So we have to put each answer in and evaluate it separately. So I would do this as I'm reading those answers. I'm going to reword it and I'm going to decide true or false. Okay. So residence rights is an example of advanced directives. No. Living will is that an advanced uh, an example of an advanced directive? Yes. Do not resuscitate is that an example of an advanced directive? Yes. And power of attorney is that an example of a uh, advanced directive? Yes. So I'm looking for the no or the false. So that would be a. Does that make sense? Okay. When you're taking a written test, always put the answer into the question and see if it's if it's correct. Okay, so you reword the question with the answer in it and see if it works. So let's go to one. So I'm going to show you how to do this. A loss of independence can cause, right, there's four answers. So let's see which one. A loss of independence can cause depression. Is that correct? Yes. A loss of independence can cause isolation or anger. Yes. A loss of independence can cause poor self-image. Yes. A loss of independence can cause all of the above. Yes. yes. So if you reword the question with the answer in it, and you can answer yes or no, it helps you figure out whether you know what the right answer is. So most of the time when like that question, like, it's going to have all of the above if all the answers, it's not going to be a tricky question. Then. No. Well, yeah. 95% of the time, when you see all of the above, it's going to be the right answer. 95% of the time. Notice I did not say 100. Because there are situations where they will put an all of the above in. And it, yeah, to trick you. So you have to evaluate every one individually but the vast majority of the time if you see that all of the above it kind of gives you a head start on the question 
Because you know 95% of the time it's going to be the right answer. Good? The questions on the written test are not designed to trick you. They're not designed to be hard. Remember, you're not allowed to think. So the questions aren't too bad. Okay. Any other questions on chapter three? I got um, 16 and 17 mixed. Okay. All right, Maslow's hierarchy and physical needs. So let's talk about Maslow. Maslow has been frustrating nursing students for eons. <laughs> All right, so there is a saying, the further a society gets away from survival, the more degraded it becomes, because you get to focus on things other than survival, right? And that's when you generally cause problems because you got three time on your hands. So that's really what Maslow is all about, okay? Um, Maslow says that you can't focus on anything else if your immediate needs are not met. So if I'm not breathing, if I'm having trouble breathing, okay, I was just stabbed in the side, poked a hole in my lung, I'm having trouble breathing. Am I really going to care about the election? No. Now you may have strong feelings one way or another on politics, but at that moment, are they going to be relevant? No. Who am I focusing on? Me. Yeah, absolutely. I have to breathe. Right? That is a immediate physical need. Make sense? Okay. So our patients that are critically ill, do they really care about anything else going on? Who are they going to be hyper-focused on? Themselves. Themselves. So that's important for us to understand, right? your patients are going to be hyper-focused on themselves and their immediate physical needs. They're not going to be able to think about anything beyond that because that has to be secure and taken care of before they can move up a level. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Anybody have your yellow book with you? Yes. Yeah, you do. Let me see that. Sorry, I don't have one in here. So let me. I know. I know you guys miss me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you are fine. Come on in. Oh my gosh. I was in the parking lot for 15 minutes, actually, because I forgot my book and my stethoscope. Oh, you were waiting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you look here on page 64 of your yellow book, you don't have to open it, but this is Maslow's hierarchy. It looks like a triangle. Okay, Maslow's hierarchy. The very bottom is physiological needs. Oxygen, right? We gotta be able to breathe. Water, that's important. You can only go about three days without water before you die, right? Food is a physiological need. Now, you can go long time without eating and still live because your body will break down its own tissues. You can go a longer time, but do you think you're going to be able to think about that election if you're super, super hungry and you haven't eaten in four days? Is that election going to matter? No, absolutely not. So that is a physiological need. Make sense? Shelter. Guys, it's cold, right? Especially up north. It's like negative numbers up north. If somebody has no shelter, if they are out in the elements, are they caring? No, they're trying to get into a warm space. That's what's going to take all of their brain power. Starting to get it? So you can't think above the level that you're struggling with. Good? Make sense? Okay, so let's say that we're good. We're breathing fine. We've got enough to eat. We've got drink. We've got shelter. We're good. Okay, we've got that level taken care of. Well, then I'm probably going to start thinking about the next level up, safety and security needs. So we've got this level taken care of. So now I'm thinking about safety. Okay, I've got shelter. I'm out of the elements. That's good. Awesome. But it happens to be a tent in the middle of the woods with a whole bunch of other people that I don't know. Am I feeling secure here? Mm -hmm. 
Probably not, right? So I'm going to be thinking about my security and my safety. That's what's going to take all of my brain power, right? I got the food and the water taken care of, but I'm a little concerned about my safety and security. So I'm able to move into a home, yay. So my safety and security is taken care of. I don't have to worry about food, shelter, uh, oxygen. I don't have to worry about safety and security because I'm in a home. So now I'm probably thinking about things like, I'm lonely, I'm bored, nobody likes me. Social media is telling me mean things, right? Because I have all of my other needs met, I can then focus on love and acceptance. Make sense? Okay, so that's here. Love and acceptance, need for self-esteem. Now, if I'm feeling loved and accepted and I've got a friend group and my family's all good and, and we're eating fine, we're drinking fine, we're in a home, all of those things are taken care of, now I can look at maybe improving myself, becoming the best version of me that I can, and that's self-actualization. But I can't work on being the best version of me if something down here is missing. Good. Now, with our patients, the people that we're caring for, they're probably missing something on the bottom of that pyramid, right? So, because they're ill. So, they're not thinking about self-actualization. They may not even be thinking about self-esteem, love and belonging. They may still be stuck on safety and security because they don't feel safe. Their body is not doing what it needs to do. So remember that when we're working with patients, they're going to be hyper-focused on them and what's going on with them. And that's Maslow. But Maslow actually helps us understand when that patient's on the call light nonstop. It's probably not because they really need water. It's probably because they're, they're deficient in that security part. They need somebody to reassure them and tell them, you're good. I'm here. You're safe. Okay. Make sense? So it helps us if we understand that so we don't get so frustrated with our patients. So that's Maslow. Okay. Now, physical need, that's what we talked about. Food, water, oxygen shelter things that you need to just survive just survive all right any questions okay let's move on we're going to do a review because you had a whole weekend oh good morning max aunt uh, i take my test i'm taking my test friday the 19th help me please well you're in the right place um, just listen to the lectures, go on to our YouTube channel under the live, and you can watch our previous lectures as well. I also have an ebook. Caitlin, if you could put the ebook up for me, um, and that'll help you uh, learn how to answer the questions on the written test. All right, so how do we know what we're going to do a review? We're going to get through this really, really quick, but we're going to remember what we learned last week before I start throwing new stuff at you because all of this is going to be in what we're learning today. Okay. So how do we know what to do with each patient? Okay. The care plan. And we follow the care plan, the whole care plan. And yeah, so can we alter it? No. Can we add to it? No. Can we change it? No. If we can't follow it, what do you do? Okay, you're going to observe, and then who are you going to report that to? The RN. The RN. Okay. Great job. Every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with no. a knock. So when you get stuck on the state exam and you don't know where to start, you're going to start with? Good. All right. And we're going to greet who? We're not greeting the evaluator? We're not going to talk to them? Why? Yeah, it's always about the patient. Very good. They don't count. Don't talk to the evaluators during your test. Act like they don't even exist. Completely ignore them. 
If you do that, you will pass because then you're focusing all your attention where it needs to be on the patient. Okay. I know a lot of people will get really nervous on the test and have to start over and they'll tell the evaluator, but they won't mention it to the patient. So the patient's the one that needs to know, not the evaluator. They're smart. They'll keep up. Couple questions. So they're not really gonna like. So they just want you to pass, like you know, do everything correctly and stuff. So if you do mess up, like they don't, they don't care that if it takes you a couple minutes just to restart. Like okay. they know you're nervous. Okay. They expect you to be nervous. In fact, if you're not nervous, that's kind of a red flag for them. Wait a minute. How many times have you taken this? Okay. Why are you not nervous over this test? We're judging you. D does this not matter to you? Are you not, you know? approaching this with the right amount of gravity. So they expect you to make a little mistake. Oh, they do. They expect you to be nervous. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you really should be a little bit nervous because that's going to make you sharper. Okay. Otherwise it's like, oh, I don't care about this test. And then you're wasting their time. Every evaluator wants to be at home in their pool, drinking their Mai Tai. They, ju they do not want to be watching you wash your hands a million times. It's, you know, they're, they're, they're being paid by the day, not by the hour. So they, they want out. They want out. Right. They, the sooner they get you done and out, the sooner they get home in their pool with their Mai Tais. That, that's what, that's their goal. So we want to make this easy for them but we don't want to waste their time. And if you show up and you're super confident and you're showing no signs at all, they may kind of get the opinion that this doesn't matter to you. And now you're wasting my time and I really want to be home. But what if it's someone who does extremely well under pressure? That's fine. That's fine. And they will know by the way you do your skills. Little confidence is good. A little nervousness is good. But when you come in cocky, that's not good. Then you might not realize you're doing it if other people observe. It, it will come through. Yeah, yeah. I, and I have seen people argue with the evaluators. Wow. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you an example. Years ago, and I'll get to your question in just a second. But years ago, blood pressure was one of the, the um, skills that you had to do on the state exam. No, it, it's not on the test anymore. We'll talk about that later today. But blood pressure was one of the skills. And students would take a blood pressure without a stethoscope. They'd completely forget to use a stethoscope. They would just put the cuff on, inflate it, and then they would just give numbers. Now, as a nurse, I know that, that, that you're pulling those numbers out of thin air. That, that's not a blood pressure. You are guessing. You're wasting my time. You did not take a blood pressure. You put a cuff on. That's not a blood pressure. Okay, we're going to get to that a little bit later, and I'll explain why. But the students cocky would say, how do you know what I got? Okay. Well, I know you didn't get the blood pressure because we record what we hear. You didn't hear anything, right? So nervous is good because that tells us you want to do a good job. Cocky is not because you're trying to pull something. You're trying to bluff your way out of this. Confident is good because that means you've practiced a few times. Confident is not cocky. Do you understand the difference? Okay. Um, I know there's two parts to the test, the written and then the um, skills. That, that skills. Mm -hmm. um, what if you missed a few and the written or and then passed the skills? So the pass? two tests are completely independent of one another. Okay. You're going to take both. It doesn't matter how you do on one. It's not going to affect your ability to take the other. So you take both sections. If you pass both sections, you're a CNA. Yeah. If you failed one section, you're still going to do the other one because you're not going to know if you pass or fail until the very end of the day as you leave. So you have to pass both. have to pass both to be a CNA. Okay. Yeah. So how does that work if you pass one, like... Are you able, how does that work? Do you get to, do you have to retake both of them? No, you only retake the portion that you failed. Okay. Yeah. So let's say that the, the most common scenario is you pass the written. Guys, the written's going to be super simple for you um, once I'm done with you. And you fail the skill because you forgot to do something silly. Okay. Um, you would, even though you failed the skills, that written test still stands for two years. So you've got to pass the skills exam, just the skills part. Um, and you've got two more attempts. So you have three total attempts. 
So the second attempt, if you failed the skills again, you would have to pay for the third attempt. So the third attempt, you take the test and you pass it. Now you're a CNA. So the second you don't have to pay? Yeah, you're going to have to pay for each attempt, but only the portion that you failed. How long do you have to wait in between? 30 days in between each attempt. You can register right away. You just can't test for 30 days. Okay. That gives you enough time to relook over things. You need to be practicing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where my videos come in. You've got the skills room available. Okay. So we're going to greet that patient. Um, we're going to address them. By name. by name. Remember, there's no ID bands for the state exam. And what do they need to know about us? Name and title. Okay. And what are we going to describe to them? And we're not going to describe the weather outside or last night's football game. Or that's We're describing what we're there to do. Although last night's football game was pretty good. All of them were just... It was crazy. It was pretty good. <laughs> All right. So what do we, once we tell them what we do, what do we need to get from them? Permission. Permission. Absolutely. Do patients have the right to say no? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, what can they say no to? Anything. Anything? Anything? Even if they're in a nursing home? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Patients have the right to refuse. Good. All right. Um, what once we get their permission, what are we going to close? The privacy, privacy curtain. curtain. And once we touch that curtain, what are we going to do? Wash our right, because we got goodies. Yeah, absolutely. Once we've washed our hands, then we're going to go get our supplies. supplies. And remember that you can't touch the patient until your hands are clean. clean. Good. All right. Great job. All right. So we're going to use gloves when we sh when we might touch what. Body body. Uh, non intact skin and personal, and personal skin. Very good. Very good. So, body fluids, non intact skin, and personal skin. Think fluids and doorways. Okay. Are you starting to look at all the body openings on your body a little bit differently? Mm -hmm. Starting to see them as doorways, mm -hmm. doorways in and out. out. That's correct. All right, so if we might possibly touch body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, we'll wear some gloves. But what's those? What's the first thing those gloves should touch? The patient, not the supplies, not you know the environment, the patient. So do all of your prep work first, and then once you have soiled gloves, be careful about what you're touching in the environment because we don't want to spread those cooties around. And we're also going to remove our gloves correctly. Remember, glove can touch glove. Glove cannot touch skin. Okay, so great job. All right, so we've done our opening. We've washed our hands. And we're now getting ready to get our supplies. What is the first thing we're going to get? The barrier. The barrier. Because we need what kind of an area? Clean. Because our supplies are clean so the barrier is all about clean very good all right so um we only touch supplies with what kind of hands clean, clean. yeah this should just be the clean principle right <laughs> okay and what can't supplies touch uniform. your uniform because your uniform is not clean, clean. okay um when do we get that barrier? Do we get it after we get all of our supplies? Before. So we're going to get the barrier first before getting our supplies. And that keeps us from holding those supplies up against our uniform while we're spreading out the barrier. Great job. All right. So remember, we also learned privacy blanket. So when do we use a privacy blanket? Or undressed. That's right. What? How does that patient feel? Cold, 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 and exposed. Yeah, they their gown is up, no sheet on. I, guys, we laugh at this, right? Because you've been taught different. You look at this, and, and you're uncomfortable with that. Never mind the patient, right? But I can't tell you how many times I've walked down a hospital hallway or a nursing home hallway. The door is wide open. The curtain is wide open. 
and all the patients' goodies are hanging out there for the world to see. And their uh, reaction is, well, they have dementia. They don't know. That No, no, just no. I don't care whether they know or not. That is not appropriate, ever. Don't be that CNA. Even if it's not your patient and you see that because they all of a sudden just kind of did themselves, you just walk in and be like, okay, I'm going to cover you. Sure, absolutely. Patients should always be covered, covered. right? So, yeah, if the patient did that themselves, (coughs) not only are we going to cover them, who are we going to tell? Yeah, because we don't know that patient might be having a psychotic episode that they need to address. Or the patient may not be a good guy. And we need to know that because there's other people in the area, right? So who would we tell? The nurse, nurse, right. All right. So we're going to use privacy blanket anytime the patient's uncovered and undressed. Um, And it's there to keep the patient warm and provide privacy. When we put the blanket on, we're going to put it on and pull the sheet down under the blanket. And that keeps the patient covered at all times. Don't just pull the sheet down and then put the blanket on because then we're exposing the patient. Okay. Do you never want to keep the privacy blanket and the sheet together? No, usually if a privacy blanket is on, we'll pull the sheet down unless we're using it because the patient said, I'm cold. It's not for privacy. Then that's fine. But that doesn't apply to the test ever. Okay. All right, so we'll put the blanket on, pull the sheet down underneath. But ha- when we put the blanket on, how, how do we do that? Okay, what don't we want to do? Shake it or snap it. Yeah, we don't want those cooties to be up where we can breathe them in. All right, and then if we do use a blanket and gloves, remember once we have gloves on, those gloves are soiled. So we need to take those gloves off before we pull the sheet up next to the patient's face. Right. You don't want those cooties on the sheet that's going to go right up next to their face. So we'll, the privacy blanket is removed after you remove gloves. Do we need to put gloves on? To, is it your opinion to put gloves on if you want to touch the blanket? or you can, okay. No. Uh, so dressing, remember we learned dressing? We didn't use gloves for dressing because we weren't touching personal. personal skin, body fluids, or non-intact skin. So we didn't need them. Right. But if we're going to do partial bed bath, now we're cleaning doorways. Do we need gloves? Yes. 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 We're also touching personal skin. Yeah. Right? So for partial bed bath, we would need gloves. So we would put the blanket on, do all of our prep work, get our water, all of those things. Put our gloves on right before we touch the Patient. patient. Do our cleaning like our care plan tells us to. Get rid of all of our soiled supplies with those gloves. And then before we remove the privacy blanket, we'll take those soiled gloves off so that when we pull the sheet up, we're not touching it with those soiled gloves. So if we're gloves, should we wash our hands then cover the patient? You don't have to because it's the patient environment, their cooties. Okay. okay. Patient cooties are fine to be in their environment. So we don't have to wash our hands until we leave that environment before we go touch another patient because we don't want to take patient A's cooties to patient B. Okay, good. All right, so what can't touch your uniform? Supplies Supplies or linens in this case, yep. And um, we have to have what kind of hands to get our linens? Clean. Clean, okay. So remember, those are the same as barrier rules. But if you see them twice on two different principles, it means they're doubly important, right? All right, so we're not gonna snap or shake our linens, again, just like privacy blanket. And um, where do we put unused linens? And yeah, yeah, in the hamper and soiled, wherever the soiled linens go. Okay, we can't just leave them there for later. We're gonna learn the rest of them today. And the closing. What kind of environment do we leave our patient in? Clean, Clean environment. All right. Um, where? Uh, how does the bed need to be positioned? Lowest, Lowest position. Lowest position. Okay. What words do they need to hear? Comfortable. Are you comfortable? And we're going to address, yeah, preferences. So magazine, TV, blanket, you know, preferences. Yes. Yep. 
Now, everything I'm teaching you, you need to do in the test. So um, the easiest way is just to offer a magazine. Okay. Um, oh, we always need to leave our patient covered. covered. Right, right. And that's for warmth and privacy. And then uh, we have to open the privacy, privacy, curtain. privacy curtain and give the patient the... Oh, doesn't matter what order you do those things in. Knock yourself out. Nobody cares. However you want to do them is fine. Just make sure you get all of those points in. Okay. And on the test, because we're working with, like, not actual patients, we're just sitting here with someone else, you always want to put a but say, like, you leave the patient and they want to be sitting upright. Mm. Just... For the test, you do not need to leave your patient flat. The bed itself needs to be in the low position, but the head of the bed, completely up to the patient. Okay. So if for the test, when you're working with, let's say we do mouth care, and we're going to have to put the patient up for mouth care because you can't brush the receipt laying down, put the head of the bed up for mouth care. At the end of mouth care, if we ask, because that's addressing preferences, are you comfortable? You want anything adjusted? Everything good? If they say, yeah, I just want, I want to stay setting up. I'm good. Th that's fine. There's no problem with that. As long as the entire bed is in low position. Okay. So that would be preferences. Now, once we get all of those things out of the way, we've got a million of the patient's cooties on us. What do we want to do? Wash our hands. Wash our hands. After we've washed our hands, if documentation is required, we will document. And then what do we need to do? Wash again, wash, wash again. Remember, you have to end scale with clean hands. Clean hands. All right. And um, once we've washed our hands, we're not going to return back to the patient because if we return to that patient, we've cootied back up. And you got to wash your hands again. And you would have to wash again. You know how we were doing the pulse? Um, and we have to do it twice. Right. After each pulse, should we wash our hands first and wear gloves? So That's this is, contact. okay, so I'm going to take your question in a couple of different ways, okay. okay? So for the test, the test, um, you're doing this with two people. You're counting twice, which you, we don't expect you to remember count number one while you're counting count number two. You're not going to. You're nervous. It's test day, right? So they're going to let you cheat a little bit and just write that number down. Okay, because they know that you're not going to remember count one as you're counting count two. So you can just write that down. You don't have to do your closing, wash your hands and all that. Where do those evaluators want to be? Home. At home, in their pool, drinking their Mai Tais. Yeah, they, they don't want to be working just like us. And we want to be at home. Right? Is that me? That is me. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, they want to be home. So if they have to wait for you to do your close, to count with, you know, count with the first evaluator, do your closing, open the curtain, here's your call light, bed is in the low position, you're covered, do you need anything out? You know, all of those things. Go wash your hands, document, wash your hands again, and then do the whole thing with the second evaluator. That's way too much time. They don't want to do that. So they're just going to tell you that you can shortcut it. You don't have to do your closing after the first reading. You can just write it down. So after the first reading, you just tell the patient on camera to do your bundles again, and then you're going to do it again with the second one, and then right. closing. Right, right, right. And you can write down that first reading. It's kind of a cheat yeah. for the you test. The vitals, mm -hmm. do you, like you said, like showing your question was, do you have to wear gloves? You okay, so let's go through gloves. That's the next thing. So if you're taking my pulse right right here is this personal skin personal skin is something normally covered by a bathing suit right so personal skin would be the breast area on females the genital area on both sexes if it's normally covered by a bathing suit it probably needs to be covered by us okay so if you're just on my wrist, this isn't something normally covered by a bathing suit. So it doesn't qualify as personal skin. Good? Mm -hmm. So we don't have personal skin. I have no body fluids there. And I have no non-intact skin, right? Because my skin is all intact. 
So if you're taking my pulse on this hand, do you need gloves? No. No. So only if they have cuts, though, like people will. Okay, so if I've got a brand new kitten at home, and that kitten has sliced me a couple of times, and I've got open areas, now do you need gloves? Yes. Yeah. Same skill, same patient, but the circumstances changed, so now you would need gloves. Okay, good? Yes. If we're testing with someone and they have cuts on their hands and things like that, we should probably put our gloves. You should wear gloves because, remember, standard precautions is used with everyone. So it doesn't matter what setting you're in, whether you're in a testing setting or a hospital or a nursing home. Because look around here. You can't tell if somebody in here has something contagious. You just don't know. So anytime you're working with blood, body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, you need gloves. doesn't matter who the patient is, even on the test. Okay, good. Can you, okay, so say like you were working with one of the mannequins for your test. Can you refer to your your patient as like Mr. or Mrs. Patient, like keep you yes. on track? Yes. In fact, when you are working with the mannequin, you're going to treat the mannequin like they're a real person. You're going to talk to them and the evaluator is going to answer. The evaluator will play the voice of the mannequin. Okay, so I don't, it doesn't matter. I don't have to make up like someone who laughs at me. I can literally just say Mr. or Mrs. Mannequin or something. Well, you're, they're actually going to tell you your patient's name is Mr. or Mrs. Jones. Oh. They use okay. one name for all, for everybody. Oh, okay. So everybody in here is now Mr. or Mrs. Jones. Okay. <laughs> yep. So that is your alter ego, your, your other identity. <laughs> okay. So Mr. or Mrs. Jones. We use a, an easy name. Some evaluators will use Smith, but most of the time it's just Jones because it's easy. Okay. All right. So good job. Um, let's review pulse. So when we're taking a pulse, what do we need to support? The arm or wrist. Yep. Pulses are always reported over what time period? A, a minute. Right. One full minute. Okay. And we're always going to follow the... Care plan. Very good. Uh, what is our normal pulse range? 60 to 100. 60 to 100. What part of our finger should we use? The finger or the tips or the flat? The tips. The tips. Okay. What finger should we not use to take a pulse? Thumb. thumb. All right. Where is the radial pulse located? On the thumb side or the pinky side? Thumb side. Thumb side. Is it way up here or is it at the bendy part? At the bendy part. At the bendy part. All right. When we're counting with an evaluator, how are they going to know when we start and when we stop? You're going to, you can count out loud or you can just say start and stop. Okay. How many evaluators do we count with in Florida? Two. Two. And once we count something, what do we need to do with it? Chart. Chart. Yeah, write it down. Don't forget to document. So do you have, like, have a little washer hands? Just kind of, they're not going to expect you to wash your hands. No, you're, you're still going to do. So this is skill specific. It's going to add to skill rules, opening, glove rules, and closing. So our closing rule says that we have to wash our hands before we document. This is just reminding you to make sure that you document. Okay. And say we miss one, like say we're doing the pulse and we miss documenting it. Is that like a lot of things? Depends on every deficiency or something without a check mark. The severity of it depends on the effect on the patient. So let's run through this real quick. Let's see how serious that is. Because right now you're thinking about it from your standpoint, right? What happens to me if I forget? Let's turn that just a little bit. What happens to the patient if you forget? Well, it depends on why we need the pulse rate to begin with. If I've got a patient who is, um, they're, heart, they're in third degree heart block and their pulse rate is only like 40 because the top and bottom of the heart is not talking, right? Um, and I have to decide whether they are um, a good candidate for a procedure, which is usually a pacemaker. Okay. I need to know, we, we can't do a surgery if their heart rate is below 40. 
So if I ask you, can you go, you know, um, take a pulse on this patient and you take it, but you never write it down. Am I going to be able to figure out the rest of their treatment plan? No. So this guy doesn't get the surgery he needs. Is that impact him? Yes. Yeah. It could be that I need you to take a pulse so I can give him medication. It could be that I need you to take a pulse so I can figure out whether we are going to do a procedure. I may need you to take a pulse to um, see how the patient tolerated exercise. I may need you, if I'm asking you to take a pulse, it's because I need that information for something, right? So what is the potential consequence to the patient if you don't write it down and I'm never made aware of that number? Sure. So you forgetting to document on the state exam is actually, it affects the patient. And it's actually kind of a big deal. So does that help you? It's not when you're taking the test. And I got three weeks to get you to make this switch. Okay. When you're taking the test, it's not, if I forget that step, how does it affect me? If I forget that step, how does it affect the patient? That's how they decide on how important that step is. Okay. So always, always, it's always about the patient. So that's kind of always about the patient. Yeah. And out there, it's always about the patient. All right. So dressing a resident, what are we going to ask them? What clothes they want to wear? Sure, absolutely. They have the right to choose their own clothing. When do we get that clothing? Before or after we undress them? Before. Before. If we are going to lift an extremity, we're going to lift from underneath, underneath with a flat palm, never from above. Okay. Um, which arm do we undress first and dress first? Strong arm. Okay, we undress the strong arm first and we dress the weak arm first. Okay, we don't want to overextend or force movement. Um, let me show you something real quick. Talk about that, just seems like a, a no brainer, right? Don't overextend or force movement. But let me show you what I mean by that. This mannequin was a testing mannequin. Hold on a minute. Let me get my... All right, you two people, hold up. We'll let you join in on the fun, too. Oh, wow, I've got 32 on today. Nice. Those are dead. Sorry, guys. Hold on. I'm just trying to get our... There we go. Okay. So this is a testing mannequin. Let me explain what I mean by don't overextend or force movement. Okay. This is a testing mannequin. She was used for testing when we are were a testing center. Now, she is not a real person, obviously, but she's made of plastic and all of her joints are held in place by steel cables, which makes them flexible. See how she's flexible, right? So she's flexible like a real person. Her knee will actually bend, right? So she's flexible like a real person. So she is held together by steel cables to make her flexible, but hold her in shape. Kind of like our bones and our muscles with me. Okay, you guys already saw it, but do you see this? Yeah. <laughs> she was a testing mannequin. Now, her other foot does not do that. Let me show you. Her other foot does not do that. 
Her other foot is like a human foot, right? Stays in the position it's supposed to. This foot does not. That means that when somebody was dressing her or doing range of motion, they snapped a steel cable. They broke their bone. That's exactly it. Absolutely. So when we say don't overextend or force movement, this is what we mean. And the mannequins will respond like a human in that things will break. This is what they're looking for. Okay, you got you have to make sure that you're providing support so that we're not and we're not moving things beyond their capacity to move. Trust me, if you break the mannequin, you're you fail the test. Not because you broke the mannequin. Why would you fail the test? Yeah, because you broke the patient. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether the patient is flesh and blood or plastic, you broke the patient. Okay. And it clearly has happened. So that's why that rule exists. Good? Someone actually break that yes, that? somebody actually broke it during testing. Um, yeah. So is that why you kind of use it as an example? So when you show these, it shows. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, we're going to adjust the clothing to make sure it's nice and neat. Where do we put the dirty items? In the hamper. And for this skill, we're going to put, put the call light in which hand? Stronger. Well, that makes sense, right? Because the weak arm may not be able to call for help. All right. Now, we didn't get to range of motion yet, so we're going to come back to that shortly. So if you look at these principles, we know, we just you just proved to me you know because we just went through all of them, right? You know the skill rules, you know the opening, you know glove rules, you know barrier rules, and you know privacy blanket. We went over most of linen rules and all of the closing. So that means that we have four left to learn. We have scoot and roll, washing rules, face and cleaning, and shoe rules. This is it. That's the last four that we have to learn. So when you look at this, understand that you're about 60% done with learning the principles. And today we're going to learn some more. Am I going too fast for anybody? No. Do you feel lost? No. Okay. All right. So let's get into hand and nail care. Let's turn to page 116. All right, so this is provide hand and nail care. We're going to read the care plan in just a minute, but this skill is going to encompass these principles. Skill rules, so we have to follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm here to perform hand and nail care. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. Barrier rules, because we have supplies, we have to have a clean place to put them. So the first supply I'm going to get is the barrier. barrier. I'll put it on the table, go get the rest of my stuff, put that on the table. Linen rules, when I'm getting my supplies, I don't want to hold them against my uniform. And anything I don't use is going to go in the hamper. Okay. Um, we also are going to evaluate if we need gloves. So we're doing hand and nail care. So this is a personal skin, right? It's nothing normally covered by a bathing suit. Hands and nails usually aren't covered by bathing suits. So I have to be concerned about whether I'm going to come into contact with body fluids or non-intact skin. So as long as the answer is no, I don't need gloves. But if the answer is yes, or maybe, do I? Yes. yes. Could you still wear gloves if it's not like... You don't need to, but like by choice for you. So here's the problem with wearing gloves all the time. When you're wearing gloves all the time for you, whether you need them or not, you're not paying attention to what you're touching with those gloves anymore, just like the sandwich. Okay. okay. So I, 
would encourage you to not wear gloves all the time, even if you don't need them, because when you do, you just stop paying attention to what you're touching. The other problem with that is an environmental problem. People don't really think about this. When you wear a set of gloves and you take them off, where do they go? Trash. trash. Right? Where does the trash go? Landfill. Landfill. Medical waste usually, though, doesn't go into your common, normal landfill. It has to go to a special landfill because it's medical waste, right? So what we used to do is burn everything. Back in the 80s, we burned all of our used gloves. But that put a lot of what we call CFCs into the atmosphere, it put a hole in our ozone layer. That was a bad thing. So they decided that burning petroleum products probably isn't a good idea. That's not a great way to get rid of this stuff. So then we just started stockpiling them in medical landfills. Okay. But they grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And, grew and somebody said, hey, this isn't sustainable. We got to do something. So they looked around and they saw this big ocean out there. They thought, we're not using that space. So they started putting medical waste in these great big, huge metal drums, poking holes in the top of the drums, taking them out in the middle of the Pacific and sinking them very deep. These metal drums fill with water, go all the way down to the bottom, very deep. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Yay. Except that now... Some of the fish that we're pulling out of the northern Pacific have high levels of latex in them. So lucky us, we poisoned our own food supply. So now they decided that's not a good option. We're going to stop doing that. And we're just stockpiling. Now, when you think about the amount of gloves that are used in healthcare, I'm just going to talk about healthcare right now. Not dental, not vet, not housekeeping, not food service, just healthcare. We use enough gloves in just healthcare every day, just in this country. I'm not talking about all the other countries, just this country. Enough gloves in healthcare every day to fill a football stadium 35 feet deep with gloves every day. Oh my gosh. Every day. Every day. That's awesome. Yeah. So basically, don't waste a pair of gloves while you're doing some of these nails. Yeah. Got it. What about, does this hand of nail care, does that go for just your? We're going to get, hold, hold up, and you're a little ahead of me. Hold up. All right, so does that make sense, right? So we're going to evaluate gloves one skill at a time. I'm going to lead you there, but one skill at a time, okay? So we notify all the care plan. We're going to do our opening, evaluate if we need gloves. We'll get a barrier for our supplies. We're going to follow our linen rules, and we have to learn washing rules and basin rules because we don't know those yet. Um, and we're going to learn skill specific follow up with the closing. I do have a video on this. If you can't remember all the steps for these, they're right here for you. All of the steps. If you look down here, you'll see test specific information. Somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this skill within 11 minutes. Guys, you're washing one hand. They're giving you 11 minutes. <laughs> Plenty of time, don't rush, okay? This is gonna be done on another testing student. That might mean you are a patient for this skill. That patient is gonna be sitting in a chair and we do not have to um, document for this one. So let's look at the two principles that we don't know. We're gonna learn washing rules and basin cleaning. So let's start with washing rules. This is on page 112. And you'll see that this, these rules, these steps are going to be found in catheter care, foot care, hand and nail care, partial bed bath, and peri care. So we have five washing rule or washing skills that we're going to learn. This is just the first. The good news is the steps are always the same. Doesn't matter which one of those skills it is. Your steps are going to be the same. Just like every skill starts with the opening. Every skill ends with the closing. Every skill that has supplies requires a barrier. Every time our patient's uncovered or undressed, we're going to use a privacy blanket. So all washing skills are going to follow these rules. Good? Okay. 
This really simplifies learning the skills. You learn the principle and then just apply it five times. So in order to understand how this works, let's go to page 113, because again, I always give you notes. You don't have to take notes. So I want you to think about how you bathe. So anybody, you know, bathe at all over the last week? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you either took a bath or a shower, depending on your preference. But the steps pretty much are the same. You get in, you get wet, you soap up, and then you rinse off, right? How many guys would feel comfortable putting shampoo in your hair and soap on your skin and not rinsing any of it off and getting out? Okay. Yeah, that's just like, who does that? <laughs> Right? But you don't think about it, do you? You just go through the steps. You get in, you get wet, you put soap on, you rinse off, you get out, you dry off. Those are steps you do all the time without ever thinking about it. It's just routine. The problem is we're not doing these steps on ourselves. We're doing them on another person. So we have to look at the steps a little bit closer. Okay. So whatever you wash, you rinse. And whatever you rinse, you dry. We're going to do the same thing with our patients. Whatever we wash, we rinse. rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. dry. That sounds very simple, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear me say that about 500 times in this course. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Because you will, for the test, forget to rinse. You will. You will. So whatever we wash, we, rinse. if you say that while you're doing the skill, whatever I wash, I, rinse. oh, I got to rinse. It keeps you on track. It's a short statement that you should be saying in your own head when you're doing a washing skill to keep you on track. Otherwise you will forget to rinse. And like we said, when you have to rinse something, right, we need water to rinse if you don't rinse, then that patient is going to have an effect. There's going to be something that happens to the patient. So because we need water to rinse, whatever we wash, we rinse, we're not going to put soap in our basin. If we put soap in that water, how are we going to rinse? Because it's soapy. So no soap in the basin. In fact, our basin is a no soap zone. No soap in the basin. We keep our water clean for rinsing. We don't need to put soap in the basin. If you wet the washcloth and put the soap on the washcloth, now the water remains clean for rinsing. Good? This is a, I guess it's a common sense type of question, but do you have to wash your private area? Yes, we're going to learn that skill called peri care a little bit later on in the program. These steps are still in peri care, so we're going to learn the steps. And then later on, we're going to learn how to apply those steps to that area. Okay. So, yes, we're going to do foot care. Absolutely. We're going to do peri care. Absolutely. We're going to learn how to bathe the whole body. Absolutely. But right now, our skill is hand and nail care. So, that's what we're going to focus on. Okay. So, whatever we wash, we rinse. rinse. So, we're not going to put soap in our water. That keeps it clean for rinsing. So no soap in the basin. Good. Now, some of you are going to be like, well, why can't we just get a second basin and put soapy water in one and have the other one for rinsing? Well, that's because everything that you use in a clinical setting, the patient has to pay for. Those basins are not free. They are not free. In fact, they're going to cost the patient about $30 to $40 per basin. Yeah. So healthcare in America is like this. Let me explain something to you because a lot of people don't understand this. How many of you guys ever go out to eat? Ever? Okay. When you choose a place to go out to eat, you base it on not just what you're hungry for, but also what you can afford, afford right? You have a budget in mind, the amount of money you're willing to spend. So 
if you went into, let's just pick on Chili's across the street, right? You go to Chili's, they seat you in a, a, a booth. And they don't give you a menu. They don't ask you what you want. They just sit you down and they decide what they're going to serve you. And there's no prices anywhere. They decide what they're going to charge you. And they don't care if you can't pay it or not. You're going to get a bill at the end and you can't leave until they have payment arrangements. That is how healthcare operates in America. You don't get to decide what's going to be done to you, what supplies are used on you. If you can afford those supplies, you just go, they use what they want, they do what they want, and then they bill you and you cannot leave until they know how you're planning on paying that bill. And if you don't pay the bill, they will take you to court. And they can garnish your pay. So as CNAs, we need to understand this because we are the ones performing all ADLs, which means that we are using supplies and those supplies are going to get billed to the patient. So we have to be aware of this so that we're not needlessly adding in things that they're going to have to pay for. One of the worst offenders for this for CNAs are toothbrushes. CNAs will throw toothbrushes away and get a new one every single day for the patient. That's $7 just to brush your teeth because they don't want to clean out a toothbrush, you know, rinse out a toothbrush. Bedpans are another one. CNAs don't want to empty bedpans, so they just throw them away. That means next time the patient has to use the restroom, we get another bedpan. That's about $42. Can you imagine paying $42 every time you go to the bathroom today? And you don't have the option of saying, I'm sorry, I can't afford it. We need to be aware of this, guys. This is important. So grabbing another basin when it's not necessary is giving your patient a bill that they may or may not be able to afford just on your whims. Make sense? We have to be good stewards for our patients. All right, so no soap zones. In order to get water, we have to think about when we're gonna get water. So let's go back in time real quick and think about how a skill runs. We have to start, every skill starts with an opening. So we have to go through Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to do hand and nail care. Is that okay? Awesome. I'm going to close the curtain, go wash my hands. Once I wash my hands, I go get the barrier, put it on the table. I go get my supplies and put those on the table. Now I need to put water in my basin. I've already washed my hands and all I've touched are clean supplies and I'm about to work on the patient. So that faucet is not clean. We know that faucet isn't clean. That means that if I'm going to turn the water on and I've got clean hands, I need a paper towel to turn that water on. Does that make sense? That keeps my hands clean. Okay, so remember your hands are clean. Carol says, hi, miss. Good morning. If I have the fifth edition, do I still need the sixth edition? Most of what is in the, well, what we're working on, thank you, Carol, good question. What we're working out of is actually the fifth edition. The fifth edition is the newest version. That's this one. This is the newest version of the book. The fourth edition, which had a red cover, you know, a red thing on it. Um, most of the information is in there, but I've added about 80 pages of content. So you can still use the fourth edition, no problem, but you're missing out on some of this content. Um, so watch the videos or upgrade to the newest version. Um, Raz says, thank you for the ebook. Love it. Very informative. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoy it. Okay. So we have to remember that we've washed our, we've done our opening. We've washed our hands. We've only gathered clean supplies. And now we're going to take that basin over to the sink to fill it up. And that sink is not clean. So we don't want to touch that sink faucet with our bare hands. Instead, we're going to get a paper towel to turn the water on. 
Good? You guys understand why? Now we got to figure out, is the water the right temperature? And we're going to use the inside of our wrist to check the water temperature. It should feel warm, not hot, not cold, just warm. So we're going to check the temperature. But we're not the only one that's going to check the temperature. The patient needs to check it too. So every washing skill, when I get water, I'm going to check it and I'm going to bring it to the patient and ask them, is this water good for you? Is it comfortable for you? Now, why is that? Let's talk about the changes of aging. So your homework tonight is going to be reading chapter four in your yellow book. Chapter four is one of my least favorite chapters. It's not a super long one, but it's needlessly complex. The whole point of chapter four is we're going to be working with older adults. Things change as we age. So you need to know what expected changes are going to occur so we know how to perform care for these individuals. Make sense? That's really what chapter four is about. They complicate it a little bit. But let me explain to you how aging works. Okay, so if I invent a thingamajig, uh, we'll just pick on this thingamajig, right? I invent this thingamajig and I'm going to have it produce. I get a patent on it. I contact a factory and I say, hey, do you build things like this? And they say yes. And I say, okay, I want to hire you to build my thingamajig. Good. Well, when I'm doing that process, when I'm deciding what factory to use, I'm going to go tour a couple different factories. And the first one I tour is brand new, state of the art, everything computerized, bright, shiny, bright lights. Um, all the machines work perfectly. It's going to give me really good quality thingamajigs in a very short amount of time. That's a good factory, isn't it? Everything's going to be high quality because it's new. But I also go tour a factory that's about 80 years old. And the gears are all rusty and some of them are missing and some of the conveyor belts don't have the belt part, right? And it only works eh, occasionally. Is that going to produce good quality thingamajigs? Mm -hmm. No. So if you were shopping for a factory, which one would you want? The new one, because it's going to give us the best quality, right? Everything's working well because it's new. All right. Our bodies are factories. Our brains are memory making factories. My heart is a blood pumping factory. My liver is a waste filtering factory, right? So every part of my body is a factory. And when I was born, my factory was brand new. Everything worked great. But as that factory gets older, it starts to wear and tear. that's right. My springs are going to fall apart. My gears are going to break a little bit. Things aren't going to work the way they used to, right? Just normal wear and tear. Well, we forget that. We forget that an 80-year-old person has an 80-year-old factory, and your brain is a memory-making factory. So if you have an 80-year-old memory-making factory, it may not make the best quality memories, which means that your 80-year-old patient may not remember if they had um, lunch today. But they can strangely remember some shoes they wore to a piano recital when they were 12. How does that work? Well, it works because your memory-making factory made that memory when it was new. So that's a good quality memory that's going to stick around for a very long time. Make sense? So as we age, a lot of times things that happen recently, we can't remember very well, but things that happened a long, long time ago, we can. Because the brain that made those memories was stronger then. Good? Make sense? Well, another thing that changes, ages with us, is our skin and our subcutaneous tissues. So when we're young, bright, shiny, new, right, we have a layer of skin, a layer of fat, and it protects our muscles. 
if you look at an arm, you can't really see the veins underneath, right? Because our factory is doing its job very well. But as we age, some changes are going to occur. The, th the skin is going to get thinner. We don't produce as much oil, so it gets drier and tends to tear easily. The layer of fat, see how it decreases? Mm -hmm. Here, it's insulating well. Here, we're losing a little bit. Here, we have very little. And in fact, in an older arm, you can actually see the veins under the skin. It looks like, like ropes under the skin. You can't see that on my, on my arm. So why can you see it on an old, old, old person, but you can't see it on just a medium old person? Okay, so there's going to be a change that happens as we age, right? Good? Make sense? The circle of life circle of life. Okay. So what does that layer of fat do and why should we care? Let's get into that because that is very relevant to what we're learning. So that layer of fat actually acts as a wetsuit. Most people don't think about this. Okay. What temperature is your body? If you put a thermometer in your mouth, what temperature is your body? Okay, so 98.6, It's we actually use a range because not everybody is spot on. So 97.6 to 99.6 is what we call our acceptable range. But let's just make this easy math. I like easy math. Let's just call it 98, okay? We'll get rid of the points for right now. 98 degrees. So me standing right here on 98 degrees, you sitting there, you're... 98 degrees. You are 98 degrees, right? We're, we're all, if I were to tell you, if you step outside, it's 98 degrees, how would you describe that weather? Hot. Hot. But yet you reach over and touch him. He is right now 98 degrees. We don't really stop and think about that, do we? It's about 70. <laughs> if he was, he'd be dead. Because you actually can't live, live, with a temperature below 93. If your body temperature falls below 93, you could die. 95 is hypothermia. 93 is dead. Make sense? Good. So we got to work really hard to keep our body temperature at 98 degrees. And a little more. 98 degrees. <laughs> So good? Any questions so far? The problem is that room temperature always wins. Always. Room temperature always wins. If you have a pie that you put in the oven and baked it at 350, when that pie comes out of the oven, it's 350 degrees. It's hot. You put it on your stove top. What's going to happen? Is that pie going to stay at 350 degrees? No. What happens to it? No. It cools. After a couple of hours, do you know what temperature that pie is going to be? Room temperature. And room temperature is usually around, let's just say, 75 degrees. Some people like it a little cooler. Some people a little warmer. Let's just use easy numbers here, 75 degrees. Okay? So that pie, even though it was 350, Room temperature always wins. Room temperature cooled it down to 75 degrees. Now, let's take a carton of ice cream out of the freezer to go with that pie. In the freezer, the ice cream is about 30 degrees. So you take that ice cream out of the freezer. It was 30 degrees. Put it on the counter and leave it there for a couple hours. What happens to that ice cream? It melts. It melts because it warms up to room temperature. Room temperature always wins. Doesn't matter what it is. Room temperature always wins. So if we have a 98 degree body and we know room temperature always wins and room temperature is right around 75 that means that there must be something that is keeping us at 98 degrees right well that is actually why you eat 
if your temperature drops below 93 degrees, you die, right? Right? So we have to be able to keep our body temperature at 98 degrees. That means that we actually inside our body have a furnace. We have a way of generating heat. The way we do that is to burn calories. Have you ever heard that saying, burn calories? It's literal. You are burning calories to generate heat to keep your body temperature at a steady 98.6 degrees. Right, right. So you guys understand that, that dynamic here. Room temperature always wins, and our body has to burn calories to keep our body temperature high, you know, in contrast to the room. So we don't want to spend a lot of calories doing that. We need, you know, we need a, an efficient system. So if we have an insulation layer, it can keep the body heat that we create inside instead of allowing it to radiate away. That's what that layer of fat does. It keeps your body heat inside and keeps it consistent. Good. It also keeps the outside temperatures out and it keeps us from responding to outside temperatures. Just like the pie responded to the room temperature by cooling down and the ice cream responded to the rooming temperature by warming up. Well, that layer of fat helps keep that room temperature from bringing us down. It provides insulation. So it keeps our body heat in, but it also protects us from outside temperatures. Good. Now, if you remember, let's go back two slides here. If you remember, we got a really nice fat layer when we're young. We call it baby fat, actually. <laughs> and in middle age, it starts to shrink a little bit. But when we get older, that, that layer of fat super small or could be gone altogether in your extremities. So that means there's not much there that's helping the patient retain their body heat. And it's going to affect outside temperatures ability to affect them. Make sense? Have you ever heard an older pe person say, I can't live up north anymore because I can't take the cold. Mm -hmm. This is why they literally can't take the cold because the cold actually affects their body temperature and makes them very uncomfortable. But it's also why grandma's house is always like 85 degrees. It's hot because if the environment is warmer, their body doesn't have to work as hard to maintain their body temperature. So that means that your older patients are going to have a different perception of temperature than you do. So we're going to check the water temperature with our wrists. We're going to make sure it's warm, not hot, not cold, just warm. But we're also going to ask our patient to check the, the uh, water temperature because we are feeling that temperature through a wetsuit. They are not. So if your patient says, oh no, that water's too hot, don't argue with them. Don't say, no, it's not. I just checked it. It's perfectly okay. Quit being a baby and let me do what I need to do. There's actually something I've heard a CNA tell a patient one time. They're not trying to be difficult. They are interpreting water temperature different than the way you interpret it because you have a wetsuit on that they no longer have. Okay. Good. Good. So the patient is going to check every water temperature every time. So if we're doing hand and nail care, we're going to get water. We're going to check it and have them check it. If we're doing foot care, we're going to get water. We're going to check it and when we're doing partial bed bath, we're going to get water. We're going to check it and get it. This is a huge checkpoint on the state exam. 
Remember I said that you are still in the, if I miss a step, what does it cost me? Right? This step, if you miss a step, what does it cost the patient? You could burn the patient if the water's too hot. Absolutely. And that's actually what happened in a facility I was working at. A, a CNA took a patient to a shower room. I'm sitting at the nurse, nurse's station. Shower room is about halfway down the hallway. And I hear screaming coming from the shower room. Mm -hmm. I run down because I'm thinking somebody fell. You know, that something bad happened because I'm hearing screaming. Yeah. I go into the shower room and it is so steamy. I couldn't see anything. My glasses are all fogged up. I'm sweating immediately as I walk in. It was steamy. And I'm like, what's going on? What, what happened? And the patient is fighting. I mean, literally fighting, hitting and kicking, sitting in a cha shower chair, naked, under the water, fighting and screaming. And the CNA is just trying to shove her under the water. Oh, oh no. Oh, my God. So what was wrong with the scenario? The CNA saw the care plan said, give the patient a shower. CNA liked hot showers. So she put a hot shower together and shoved the patient under the water. What was wrong? And what is that Ah, did the patient like a hot shower? How many of you guys like super hot showers? I do. Man, I want that water hot enough to take skin off, right? I like hot water. Yeah, my husband hates hot showers. He wants cool. He works outside in the heat, and he likes the cooling shower to help cool him down after working outside, right? Everybody has different water temperature preferences. Yours is not necessarily the patient. Yeah. But the real problem here is that the CNA did not understand that the patient doesn't have the same insulator that we do. So that patient was feeling that hot water as boiling. You guys understand that? Do you think you would kick and hit and try to get out from that water if it were you? If your patient becomes, this is important, guys. If your patient becomes combative when you are doing a skill, it is almost always you. Does that make sense? I heard that from someone else that was working in like a nursing home. And she ended up leaving and going somewhere else because she felt guilty because she knew what she did. Mm, that's sad. I don't remember what she did, but at least she left. Yeah. Like, if, if the patient becomes combative, it's almost always you. Now, I know some of you are going to say, hold up, dementia. Those people are combative at nothing. Right? They get combative at nothing. If you're working with dementia patients, you need to understand and learn how to approach them and how to give them limited choices so they can still have some level of control. So instead of asking a dementia patient, would you like a shower today? I'm going to ask a dementia patient, would you like your shower before or after breakfast? Limited choices. That way they feel some level of control. Anybody ever see a two-year-old? I love two-year-olds. Probably my favorite creature on the planet too. Because two-year-olds are just learning to um, establish independence. They learn that they are an entity separate from everybody else. And in order to learn power, they use no. Mm -hmm. Every two-year-old on the planet, you ask them if they want to do something, they will always respond with no. And the reason is they're learning power. That, that word is very powerful. And to your uh, adult, uh, parents get really mad at two-year-olds, right? I love it because they're actually hitting a developmental my, milestone. So if you've got a two-year-old, never ask them a yes-no question because you will always get no, always. That's their power. Give them power through limited choices. 
limited choices. You limit the choices, but never make it a yes, no. You never ask a two-year-old a yes, no question ever. It'll always be no, because that's how they establish power in that dynamic. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Dementia patients, same thing. The only power they have is no. Now, if we're trampling over that, they're going to react negatively because now they feel powerless. Go back to Maslow's hierarchy, mm -hmm. right? Now they feel powerless and they can become combative. So dementia patients are often combative if they don't understand what you're doing or if they feel powerless. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Not always. Sometimes dementia patients just get combative because, you know, they're having a bad day. Well, in that case, we need to kind of work around that. Okay. So I know you say always have a patient. So you said on the exam, you're, of course, we're not going to bathe our person, but like you're, they're going to ask you to have them touch the water because you're doing the skills. Absolutely. Okay. So when we're doing hand and nail care and you're doing it on another person, you're going to ask them, can you check the water temperature? And if it's too hot, you can sort of say out a little bit of like colder water. Right. For the test, though, if you remember on the first day, I told you that you'll get a script to follow when you're the patient. They're going to tell you to be pleasant, cooperative, and you. So that means she's going to put her hand in the water, and as long as it's reasonably okay, she's going to say it's fine. But if she said it's too hot, you need to address it. You don't tell her, that's fine. Just put your hand in there. Are you allowed to put our hand in there? You're going to use the, your wrist to check the water temperature as the water is running before you fill the basin. Good. Questions? Am I going too fast? Patients check water temperature every time. All right. So the order matters here. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Don't forget your steps. Okay. This is super, super important. Now, there's one there that I've got blanked out. We're going to learn that a little bit later on in the program. So just like privacy rules, there's one that I'm not going to talk about because I have a whole lecture on it. Okay. Um, but if we leave soap on the skin, this is actually a microscopic view of soap left on the skin. Do you see those flakes? Yeah. See how it dries out the skin? Okay. Leave that there long enough and cracks will actually form in the skin. Cracks are doorways. What do we know about doorways? Pathogens. pathogens can let pathogens in or out. This is not good. So do you think rinsing is important? Yes. Yes. It lim it, it's going to limit the amount of doorways your patient develops. So wa whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry. And I told you that is the number one thing that people miss on the test. They forget to rinse. So don't. All right, so we want to monitor this water. Remember I said that you've got up to 11 minutes to do this? You're washing one hand, guys. This does not take 11 minutes. But if you're super slow about this, what do you think is going to happen to that water over 11 minutes? It gets cold. Yeah, room temperature always wins. wins, right? Room temperature water feels cold to us. So um, anybody ever go to the springs mm -hmm. to swim? Anybody ever go to the springs? Like Wiki Wachi, Rainbow River. Okay. Yeah. So what's the, I grew up on the rainbow. Uh, what's the temperature? It's 72 year round. Yeah. Yeah. So this room is 75, right? Right. Okay. 72 degree water is super cold. 75 degree water is still going to feel cold. Good. So we got to watch that water. If we're taking a super long time to do this, that water is going to cool down. That's going to feel uncomfortable to the patient. So if the water gets cold or soapy, we have to change it out. Why do we only wash it with one hand? Is it one hand at a time or just one hand in general? We're going to get there, but we follow the airplane. We don't care why. Maybe the patient is having a procedure done on that hand later that day. And they don't want any soap residue on it. So just in general, just always fall off their hand. You don't Absolutely. Not in general. That is our entire purpose of, of being is following the care plan. It's up to the nurse to make that decision. I only want one hand. Oh. Or I want two. 
they know what's happening with the patients. We're never in that position where we're going to make that decision. We follow the care plan. Care plan. So we're going to get to the care plan for this skill in just a minute. All right. So we're going to change the water if it gets cold or soapy. And we want to be careful when we're working with water, not to let it drip on the floor, on the bed, basically anywhere. Keep your water contained. If it does drip on the test, don't ignore it. Do not ignore it. If you get water that drips on the floor during the test and you leave it there and say, my skill is done, that's a safety infraction because anybody can slip on that water. That means that you would leave it in a clinical setting too. So if you drip water on the floor before the end of the skill, you need to wipe it up. Okay, good. Dry surface should remain dry. All right. And um, if we're going to put lotion on, we warm it up first and then we wipe off the excess. Okay. We don't leave lotion on the surface of the skin because if they got to pick up a cup of hot coffee and they've got lotion on their hand, it'll slip and that's a safety problem. So lotion is always warmed up in our hands to bring it up to body temperature, placed on the patient, and then we take a towel to dry off whatever's left whatever didn't soak in. Good? Questions on washing rules? I, I, keep, I, I have one, but... Go I, ahead. You know, I don't remember. Like, it just... Okay. I'll probably think of it. Let's go ahead and take our break, and then we're going to get into basin cleaning. Okay? So we'll take the break. Come back at 10 after. Oh, yes, I remember. So, like, does it matter, like, what you want to mess with? Like, paper towels, dirty paper towels, and anything you can just use them. There, there's paper. Just like over here, we have paper towels because you need them to dry your hands. You will have paper towels available in the testing room, too. Yeah. Hi guys, it's don't worry, it's on the sheet that I don't have. What's the question? Yes, we're gonna do that today. I ordered this little package off the of Amazon. This is what I got in here. I got a few together. It comes apart. Yeah, girl. That was so <laughs> intro. Not because I got one over from the city. Yeah, girl. Mine's a towel. One of these, too. I got one from this pack. That looks comfortable. That looks also really good. Yeah, those look comfortable. I really, because that's what I should have looked harder. Yeah. The white ones are like a different one. Are those in packs? Yeah. Is that the kit that you bought? $100. Yeah, that sounds really yeah. Mm -hmm. No, well, I got the kit. Point four, but yeah. that's what I that's got. What and it kind of seems very, very cheap, but when, I get, when I get more yeah, into, yeah, when you get actually working, I'll probably get something better. I mean, it works. I only want to like the ear things, things, like the ear tips. Yeah, I got this There's so a lot of them at Amazon for thirty five yeah, ninety nine. Cool. With the blood pressure pills too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got it all right here. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know why, but it's it just not as interesting as the age. I'm probably the oldest. Like 40? Yeah. Oh, you're so a bit old. Uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, like $30. You're older? Really? When you take care of yourself, like that's why it's kind of hard. Like, it's hard to wonder. When you take care of yourself and you don't, like, you don't, you like, 
I want to guess 40s. I want to guess 40s. I want to guess 40. That's what I'm saying.
All right, sorry guys. It's, uh, I was going to ask you if you were, I saw your, your link and I was thinking, I was like, I can't promise you. All right, you guys ready to get started? Yes. Yeah. Wondering. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. There we go. Page 90. I'm trying to find the right place. Page 90. We're going to talk about base and cleaning. So we learned washing rules. We're now moving on to base and cleaning. Because when we wash something, that means we have to have a basin that's holding the water. Remember that nothing ever goes into that basin. We don't put soap in it. We don't put dirty washcloths in it. It's just holding water. But at the end of the skill, we still have to clean it. So we have to learn how to clean our basins. Now, most of the time, we're simply going to rinse it, dry it, and put it away. That's all that's required here. Rinsing it, drying it, and putting it away. In some cases, you will have to disinfect a basin, though. Um, not for the test, but you need to have a process that allows for disinfection. So one process that we're going to learn, but we can slide disinfection into this process if we need to disinfect. Good. We're working with a patient on chemo. We've destroyed their immune system. We don't want any pathogens hanging around. So we're not going to just rinse it, dry it, and store it, we want to take an extra step. Make sense? Good. All right, so let's learn basin cleaning. All your notes are on page 91. So when we're working with basins, and a basin could be a bath basin, like what we're going to use for hand and nail care. It could be like a little kidney-shaped basin. We call them emesis basins um, for mouth care. It could be a bedpan right? A basin is just anything that holds liquid. So it could be a bedpan, could be a urine um, measuring cup. Basically, if it held liquid and we are going to clean it, we're going to follow these steps. So we're going to empty our basin wherever it would normally be, normally go. When you brush your teeth, where are you standing? The sink. So mouth care stuff would go in the Sink. When you um, use the restroom, where does your pee go? Toilet. toilet. So if we're dumping urine, it would go in the toilet. toilet. If somebody is throwing up, where would that normally happen? Toilet. So we would put that in the toilet. So we're going to put whatever liquid it is, wherever it would normally go. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Some people use... If it's above the waist, it goes in the sink. If it's below the waist, it goes in the toilet. But that isn't really a good standard because emesis or vomit should not go in the sink. Mm -hmm. it could be thick, thick, yeah, thick, thick chunky. Liquid, yeah. Good? Makes sense? So a better way of thinking about this is put it where it normally goes. Okay. All right, so once we've dumped our basin in the sink or the toilet where it normally goes, then we're going to rinse it out. Now, for the test, that's all we got to do here. We're going to rinse it. We're going to put the rinse water wherever we put the liquid. So if we're rinsing out urine, we're going to dump the rinse water in the toilet. Yeah, if we're rinsing out for mouth care, we'll dump the rinse water in the sink. Make sense? Good? Questions so, so far? Now, we do not need to use soap for the exam. You will follow your facility policy and the care plan for the patient. But for the test, all we got to do is rinse it. But after we rinse it, that's when disinfection would happen. If we have to disinfect. Remember, we're not disinfecting for the test. But if we do need to disinfect, that's when it would happen is after we've rinsed. 
you can't disinfect something if you're holding on to it, right? Your dirty hands or dirty gloves, if it's holding the item, you can't disinfect it because you're automatically contaminating it. We have to be hands off to disinfect. That means that after we have rinsed and disposed of our rinse water, we're going to set the basin down in the sink. Remember that basins are only used by that one patient. We don't spread them around. Bas uh, basins are single patient use. So this guy's bedpan is only going to be used on this guy. That one doesn't get to use it. This guy's mouth care basin is only used for this guy. That guy doesn't use it. Make sense? So rinsing, drying, and storing is perfectly okay in most, most settings. Hold on one second. But if we do need to disinfect, we're going to put the, the basin down in the sink before we spray it. Because if I spray it like this, see how my gloved hand is holding that basin? If I spray that basin, then wherever my gloved hand is, is not getting disinfected. Go ahead. Are you going to like, is it just based on our facility, like when it's appropriate to change the basin? Right. Okay, right. Whatever they say. Your facility will go. Oh, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. But for the most part. You never really have to. No. Clean it correctly. Right. As long as, as you're taking care of it. Okay. Yep. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll dump it. We'll rinse it. We'll set, dump that rinse water and set it down. If we have to spray it, that's when it would happen. But for the test, we're going to skip that step. We're not going to spray anything for the test. Now, the reason we used to, we used to, but the reason is a lot of people have respiratory issues, reactive airway disease, asthma, that type of thing. And when you're spraying, it can make you cough or, you know, irritate that. So for the test, they don't have us spray anything to try to keep, you know, students from having an issue. Good? Make sense? Okay. So we dump it, we rinse it, we set it down, and we do not spray it for the test. But if you needed to, that's when it would happen. Now we're going to pick it up, but we can't pick it up with our hands or our gloves. We could, but that's a whole nother set of gloves, and that's an expense. What else could we use between our soiled gloves and that basin? A paper towel. That's right. So we don't want to just touch the basin with our soiled gloves. We want to use a paper towel between the basin and our gloves. Good? Yeah. Okay. So we um, are going to dry the inside with a paper towel. But while we're doing that, don't touch the basin with your glove. Just make sure that you're you know, keeping the basin clean. And we're going to dry the outside with a different paper towel. And we'll throw those away. And now we got to put our basin away. We still have our gloves on or our hands are still dirty, either one. And we got to open that drawer. Should Do you think we should touch that drawer with our soiled hands or gloves? So what could we use between our soiled hands or gloves and the drawer? A paper towel. Good. So we'll pick up our supplies with that paper towel, put them in our basin, put our basin away by using the paper towel to open the drawer. And now we're going to throw all those paper towels away. So you're going to see this whole process in the next skill that we're going to learn, hand and nail care. Um, but we empty the basin, rinse it, empty the rinse water, set it down, and then pick it up with a paper towel. Use paper towel to dry the inside. Use a different paper towel to dry the outside. And then we're going to grab one for the supplies in the drawer. When we're all done, we'll get rid of all of the paper towels. And we can then remove our gloves if we don't have anything else to touch that's dirty. So you wash your hands, though. At the end of the scale, you can wash your hands when you remove your gloves. It's fine. But remember, it's patient cooties, patient environment. You can wait until the end of the scale to wash your hands. Okay. If you're washing them or like cleaning or whatever, all of a sudden like they start bleeding. Something happens, blood or whatever, and it's and you're walking like the pan or whatever. Like, how do you handle that? Like, Your facility policy. Okay, it's always going to be always okay. facility policy. That's why we really need to know that policy and procedure manual. 
right? Because cleaning basins that have body fluids may require a, a specific method. Cleaning basins that have infectious body fluids may need a different process. So we've got a patient on isolation. Okay, so we know there's a known pathogen and they're on body fluid isolation. So we know that their body fluids have this known pathogen. Your facility for that patient may have you dispose of all um, uh, patient use items after, after use. Okay, so a lot of stuff that I am asking is a lot from the facility. Facility and patient specific as well. Okay, good. If in doubt, who would you ask? The nurse. The nurse. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to see a basin cleaning and a lot of skills. Don't worry if you don't get all the steps right away. You're going to see this over and over and over. But just remember, this looks complex, but at the end of the day, all we're doing is rinsing, drying, and storing. Try not to touch the drawer with those dirty hands or gloves. Okay? That's what they're grading us on. And everything is clean the exact same way. So these are our rules. We're going to empty the basin in the sink. We're going to rinse the basin with one running water and then set it down in the sink. We're going to disinfect if we need to and use a paper towel to pick it up. We'll use a paper towel to dry the inside, another one to dry the outside, and use another paper towel to get our supplies and open the drawer. And then we're going to get rid of all the paper towels. It's I don't know how to ask this question, but they're grading you on the whole, on the whole, the whole. They're grading you on the whole skill, okay, the whole skill. which has, if you're looking at hand and nail care, it has 32 steps. Okay. Now in those 32 steps, you're going to have the opening. You're going to have the barrier. You're going to have um, whatever you wash, you rinse, whatever you rinse, you dry. You're going to have um, using gloves if necessary. You're going to have cleaning the basin and you're going to do your closing. So in those 32 steps are all of these principles. Now I could just teach you all 32 steps, but most of those steps are going to be repeated in other skills. So it's easier to learn the steps and apply them to the skills rather than to learn 21 skills. This is a total of six, six different um, skills they're going to grade us on? They're going to give you three to demonstrate out of 21 that we're learning. Wow. Okay, so we're going to learn 21 skills. We've learned two so far. We're going to learn 21 skills and they are going to assign you to do three. One of them is an ADL skill. One of them is a um, mobility skill. And one of them is a documentation skill. So in your book on page 24, you'll see that. Remember 25 are all the testing care plans. Oh, okay, always on the, the care plan. That's the care plan set. Yep. All right, so let's go over the specific steps for hand and nail care. Now, we know we're going to follow the... Every skill starts with the opening. Every opening starts with... If we're going to use supplies, we need a clean place to put them. So what are we going to get first? Okay, we're going to decide if we need gloves. So if we're going to touch any... Um, body fluids, any non-intact skin or personal skin, then we need gloves. Yes. If we're going to get linens, we're not going to hold them against our, mm -hmm. and if we don't use them, we put them in the basket. Yeah, hamper. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. 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 Um, no soap in the, Basin. we're going to check the water. What should it feel like? Warm. 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 Who else checks it? Patient. The patient. Okay, try not to get your surface wet, and if you do, address it. Mm -hmm. And if you put lotion on, you're going to warm it up first, and then what do we do? Dry Dry wipe off the excess, right? 
And then we're going to clean our basin that held water by rinsing, drying, and storing, but don't touch the, the um, drawer without a paper towel. And then we're going to end the scale. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you? Are you comfortable? Would you like a magazine before I go? Bed's in low position. You're covered. Everything's clean and safe. Open the curtain. Here's your call light. Wash my hands. And then call the... And then, or, after right, you do that, it. then you call the... Uh, evaluate that you're done? Yep. Then you okay. could say your skill is done. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let's look at the test-specific steps that we need to complete in addition to everything we just talked about. Okay, so we're going to soak the hand in water. Okay, we're going to wash, rinse, and dry. We're going to clean under the nails with the beveled end of the orange stick. We're going to wipe that off in between nails. We're going to make sure the hand is supported on a towel while we do this. We'll use an emery board to file the nails in one direction. We'll support the wrist and arm at all times, and we'll apply lotion last. Those are the steps involved in this particular skill. So if you go to page 117, I don't have that in here. I got to add it. Um, if you go to page 117, you'll see the care plan at the top of the page. It says provide hand and nail care to one hand. What if the patient has two? We don't care. Care plan said one hand. one hand. We get to pick which one. Pick one. No care plan out there is going to say one hand without indicating which one. For the test, they let you pick. Usually, you'll be doing this on two hands. You can do them both at the same time, but for the test, where do those evaluators want to be? At home. at home, floating in their pool, drinking their Mai Tais. If they watch you soak one hand, wash one hand, rinse one hand, Dry one hand, clean under the nails of one hand, and file the nails of one hand, and apply lotion to one hand. They don't need to see it on the other side. They know you got it. So one hand is enough for the test. Okay? It's time saver. And you got 11 minutes to get all of that done. If you look at the bottom of the screen, or bottom of the page here, you'll see all of the supplies required for this skill, and there are a lot of supplies. You need a barrier. You need a basin, you need soap and lotion, you need one towel and two washcloths, you need an orange stick and an emery board. So a lot of supplies for this particular skill. You have to learn the supplies. Nobody's going to tell you this is what you need. You have to learn them. And that's where flashcards are going to come in handy to learn those supplies. But try to make it make sense to you, right? I'm going to be washing something. I need something to hold water. I need some washcloths, one to wash, one to rinse. I need soap, because washing. Uh, this particular skill, I need some lotion as well. If I wash and rinse, I have to dry. That means I need a towel. Mm -hmm. And I know hand nail care means I have to clean the nails and file them. So I need an orange stick and an emery board. Okay, so make it make sense to you. Good? I'm going to show you the video for this one because it has really good close-ups. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Wonderful. I need to do hand and nail care on one hand. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands and then I'll gather my supplies. Okay. Okay, we're going to start with the barrier. So I'll place the barrier on the table and that will give me a place to set your clean supplies.
And then I'm going to gather a basin, soap, and lotion. An orange stick and emery board. Two washcloths and a towel. I'm going to go get some water in the basin. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature, make sure it's okay? It is, is it good? Yes. Okay, you can submerge your hand in there if you'd like. Okay. And I'll bring that tray a little bit closer to you. Thank you. Is that comfortable? Yeah. I'm going to place the washcloths in here. And we'll wet one of the washcloths and use it to get your hand wet. Now I'm going to place your hand over here on the towel. Apply soap to the washcloth. And now I'm going to wash all surfaces of your hand, including in between the fingers, in this area between the thumb and the forefinger. I'm going to turn your hand over now and wash the palm of your hand. Now we're going to place your hand back in the basin to rinse. Okay, I'm going to bring your hand over here to dry. I'm going to dry between the fingers. And then I'm going to turn your hand over and dry the palm of the hand as well. Okay. Now we'll take the orange stick and I'm going to clean under each nail. Just cleaning the edge. Does that hurt? No. Very good. We'll wipe the orange stick on the towel in between each finger. And now I'm going to file any rough edges. So I'll file from the outer edge to the middle. Checking each nail for any rough edges. And now we can apply lotion. So I'll get a little lotion, warm it up in my hands, and apply it to all surfaces of your hand. That feel good? Yes. Very good. Okay. Now we'll wipe off the lotion. Okay. How's that? Great. Wonderful. I'm going to place my soiled linens in dirty linen container and then clean up my workspace. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, on the way, we'll pick up the soap and the lotion and place them in the basin. We'll use the paper towel to open the drawer and place the basin in. These items will get thrown away. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Can I offer you a magazine? No, ma'am. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right there. Please use it to call me if you have a need. I'm going to open your curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done.
so one of the things that I want to bring to your attention, um, because wherever you go to work, they're going to have specific scrub requirements for you, specific colors, sometimes even styles. But a lot of times when you're brand new into the industry, you don't really know which scrubs are right for you because you have to look at a lot of different variables, right? So what is the right um, budget for me? That's a big consideration. What kind of materials do I like? Some people like cotton. Some people um, find cotton too stiff. You know, they prefer the silkier materials. So what do you like things? Do you like the joggers? Do you like straight leg? Do you like flare leg? Do you like two pockets here? Or do you want to tuck it in, right? There's a lot of variables there. This quiz is free. And it'll, you just answer a couple of questions and it'll actually give you the specific style with the style numbers of the scrubs that will work best for you in your price range. And it's uh, free. It's on Cherokee dash, uh, no, I'm sorry. It's Cherokee dash scrubs.com, not uniform. Sorry. So what the skill you just said, you don't have to put them back in there. They can sit in that chair. Right. Our care plan did not tell us that we had to return the patient back to bed. Okay. Yep. So, Kaylin, can you change that for me? Cherokee-scrubs.com. And you can take that down now. I just wanted to put that up to remind them. But once you take it down, can you change it for me? Cherokee-scrubs.com. And it actually has Amazon links to each, um, each item that, uh, you know, fits your criteria so you can see what it looks like and you can order right there cherokee-scrubs.com and it's free you. you know how much attention i put into this class a lot right a lot right that's what i did for the quiz i created that quiz oh yeah really? yeah and it's being used all over the nation so but it's but that's that's the kind of attention I put into the quiz. It takes literally two minutes to go through. Two minutes. And it'll give you the exact scrubs that are right for you. All right. So let's move on to page 141. 141, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> This is, <laughs> this is making an occupied bed. So when we're looking at this, of course, we have to figure out what principles we're going to use for this particular skill. We're going to use skill rules. Do we know that? Yes. We're going to use the opening. Do we know that? Yes. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. Do we know that? Yes. We're going to use a barrier because we need supplies. Do we know that? Mm -hmm. Patient's going to be uncovered for the skill. So what else do we need? Privacy, Privacy blanket. And when we're getting linens, we uh, don't want to press them against our uniform. And if we don't use it, we're going to discard it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a new one here that we aren't familiar with. Scoot and roll. That means that we have to learn a principle. And then <laughs> uh, we're going to do the closing, which we all also no. So let's focus on finishing up linen rules because remember we learned most of, but there were two pieces to linen rules we didn't learn. So we'll focus on that. And then we're going to learn a little bit about scoot and roll as well. So clean rolls toward you, dirty rolls away. When we're changing things on a bed. Now, of course, it's way easier to make a bed when nobody's in it. I can make a bed with no one in it in like two minutes takes a whole lot longer to make a bed with someone in it because now we're working around a body, right? So if I have an empty bed, if the patient went to have a test done, if they're have, you know, getting a shower, if, if the bed is empty, that's a great time to change the sheets. So I always, if I walk by an empty bed, I always think, do those sheets need to be changed? If so, let me get that done quick because it'll save me time later, Okay. But we have to know how to change sheets with a body in the bed because that does come up sometimes. We have to learn how to do this. So when we're changing things underneath a patient, there has to be a process that we use. And that process is clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. 
So let me show you what, how this works. To show you this, I'm going to get a washcloth. Okay, so if we have if we have a sheet already on the bed, this is my bed, this is my sheet, this is my patient. Good? Okay, so we have a sheet already on the bed. If I want to change this sheet from under this patient and put a new sheet under them, then I have to do it a half at a time. So a half of the bed at a time. I don't want this patient laying on the bare mattress. That's kind of icky. Mm -hmm. So I've got to make sure that there's always something underneath the patient. So this is dirty. I'm going to roll dirty toward the patient that keeps the dirty stuff on the inside, right? So the part I'm touching is not the dirty part. Good. I'm going to take the clean sheet and roll it toward me. So again, the clean part that's going to be touching the patient is on the inside. So the underside of the sheet and the underside of the sheet is all that's going to touch because I'm going to tuck this one under that one. And then I'm going to have the patient roll over. I'm going to take that sheet off and unroll that one. Have them return to the middle of the bed. So I was able to do this without the patient ever touching the bare mattress and without the sheets contaminating each other because the underside of one sheet touched the underside of the other sheet. Make sense? So you can see that on here. You can see the white sheet and the blue sheet. The patient is on the white sheet We've rolled it and tucked it underneath the patient. The blue sheet we attached to the corners of the bed, rolled it toward us, and we're going to tuck that underneath. And they go to the other side of the bed and do it all again. So we're making the bed a half at a time. We don't want clean or dirty linens to touch the floor. So if we have a sheet that's dragging on the floor, we got to get rid of it. We, we need a new sheet. Doesn't matter whether it's clean or dirty. Dirty sheets contaminate the floor. Clean sheets get contaminated by the floor. So nothing ever touches the floor. If it does, we get rid of it and start over. Okay, good. When we remove something from the bed, you want to wind it up in a ball so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. Okay, good. So no linens touch the floor. It doesn't matter whether they're clean or dirty. They don't touch the floor. I have a question. So if you went into your patient's room mm -hmm. and half of it's hanging that they put it on the floor. Yep. So we should be getting a new sheet for them. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Those floors are not clean. People. So when you go to work, right, at the beginning of your shift, you're coming in from outside. You wore those shoes outside. You wore them in your house. You wore them at Publix. You know, your shoes have been all over everything. You're going to walk into the facility with those shoes on, which means if you multiply that by all the people that work in the facility, there's a lot of pathogens on that floor. Your patients probably have a couple of extra doorways, incisions, wounds, rashes, sores, we don't want those pathogens from the floor to have access to our patient's new doorways. Good? Make sense? All right. But there's a problem here because we're learning to make an occupied bed. When you change the sheets on your bed at home, you probably take the sheet off the bed, bundle it up, and throw it on the floor. Most people do. But I just told you, that nothing can go on the floor. So what we do at home, we can't do in a clinical setting. We can't take a sheet off the bed and just throw it on the floor to be put in dirty linen later. The other problem is that these hampers, what you see here and what you see over there, these hampers in a clinical setting are not in the patient's room. 
they're in a hallway or they might even be in a soiled utility room, which is a, a specific room that's designated as dirty that we put all the dirty stuff in. So if we don't have a hamper in the room, and I told you you can't take the dirty stuff off and put it on the floor, then where does it go? So in a clinical setting, we usually use a, use a soiled linen bag. It'll actually be stamped. It's a light blue bag. It's stamped, soiled, or soiled linens. If you take that into the room, open it up, the bag can go on the floor, and the dirty stuff can go in the bag, but it can't go directly on the floor. If you don't have a bag, you can use a barrier. Put a barrier on the floor. Put your linens on the barrier. But linens cannot touch the floor directly. They need to go into a bag, on a chucks, or if you have a hamper in the room, you can put it in there. For the test, you're going to have a hamper in the room. So it can go directly in there. I was going to say, I, I hope that that should just be smart, like a new thing that every facility should just do is put one in the rooms, just to make it easier. And then the baggie, if they're reusable, use the baggie and like wash it or some kind of thing, you know, something. The problem with that, and I, I agree, it, it, it's very um, convenient. Mm -hmm. The problem is that generally speaking, we don't like anything dirty left in the patient's room. Mm -hmm. So that's why they generally don't have hampers in the patient's room because that leaves dirty items in the room. That's why the hampers are usually in the hallway or even better in a soiled utility room that um, you take the bags to. And sometimes you have like dementia patients and you let like to get in dirty clothes basket. And yeah. Like, I'm a resident and his name's, oh, I can't say his name, sorry. But he likes to get in people dirty clothes and put their dirty clothes on and stuff like that so sometimes it's not good they yeah it's that's so what sad. we generally have don't keep dirty items in the patient's room in most settings now if you're in home care it's a little bit different but um in most settings okay but i mean you're right that would make it a lot easier but um it's just not good from an infection control standpoint all right, so most settings have a room similar to this. We call it soiled utility. It usually has a keypad on it so that visitors can't just wander in because this is where all of our dirty stuff goes. You'll usually have a toilet or something that looks like a toilet without a seat. A lot of times they're kind of square, but they still have a flusher like a toilet does. You can't really sit on it. There's no seat. So what is it there for? It's actually called a hopper. And it's used to clean uh, solid waste from sheets or clothing or things like that. So it operates kind of like a toilet, no lit, you know, no seat on it, um, but it runs water into it to allow us to clean solid waste off. So you may see that in your soiled room. You'll also have some shelves with, um, you know, soiled. Uh, or items to take care of soil, like our soil linen bags and things like that. You'll always have a sink to wash your hands before you leave soil utility. That's where your biohazard items are usually kept. And you probably will have a hamper, some other items in there. But your soil utility room, everybody needs to know where it is on your unit because that's where all dirty things go. Okay. Never, ever, ever take a clean item into a soiled utility room. If you do, it's automatically considered soiled. Soiled items should never go in a clean utility room. Okay, good. We already know this. Linens, we use it or we lose it, right? If we don't, if we take too many, don't use them on the, the skill, then we have to put them in dirty linens. Go ahead. Yeah, we can't put it back if you already touched it. Can't put it back. Yeah, can't put it back. Use it or lose it. All right. So um, one thing about those soiled bags, a lot of people don't know. This is kind of important. Everybody familiar with Tide Pods? You know, you throw the, the little pods in the um, washing machine and they dissolve and wash your stuff and it holds your soap, right? Well, those uh, soiled linen bags are the original Tide Pods. They've been around for years and years and years and years. The bags themselves go into the washer. They dissolve and they become the soap. 
So that means that whatever's in that bag is going directly in the washer. Nobody's going to shake those sheets out and look for hearing aids and dentures and cell phones and cell phone chargers and pens and all those other things. So when we're bundling up sheets and putting them in the soiled utility bag, you've got to make sure that there's nothing foreign in there. Okay. Use gloves to like open it up, check it, whatever. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You want to to as your remember clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. So as you're rolling those sheets, make sure there's nothing in there that shouldn't go in the washer. As far as gloves go, it depends on what we're dealing with. If we've got a fully clothed individual holding on to all of their own body fluids like a champ, and we're not touching any personal skin then or you know they, they, they haven't bled or peed or anything on these sheets we don't need gloves to change the sheets you can wear them if you want but you don't need them it's not requirement because you're not touching any body fluids blood personal skin or non-intact skin but if the patient is incontinent and there's urine on the sheets do i need gloves mm -hmm. yes okay for the test you're doing this on another testing student that's fully clothed and holding on all their body fluids so for the test, we are not required to wear gloves for this skill. All right, so let's talk about scoot and roll. I'm going to make this pretty quick. You are not going to have side rails in all settings. Side rails are a restraint. They keep the patient from freedom of movement. They keep them in bed. No one has the right to make you stay in bed if you don't want to stay in bed because you are an adult. You don't have the right to force any other adult to stay in bed if they don't want to stay in bed. And that's why you won't see side rails in most settings. They are a restraint and they require a doctor's order to use. Okay. Side rails do not keep your patient safe. You roll a patient onto their side and there's a side rail there to keep them from falling. There's no way that you know that that side rail isn't going to fail. And if the side rail fails, what happens? They fall. That's right. They get injured. Side rails do not keep people safe. And in fact, they do something even more dangerous because when you put an adult in a bed and put the side rails up and tell them to stay and they don't want to, they're not going to listen. They are going to go over, under, around, or through those side rails, and side rails kill patients. Yes, it has happened. Yes. Side rails kill several hundred people a year. We have to do better than that. Side rails alone are not safe. Most settings now don't use side rails, especially in the hospitals. We hire sitters. A sitter is somebody that is paid to sit at the bedside. Instead of side rails, if the patient is trying to get up, that person will be responsible for keeping them safe or for notifying staff or talking the patient into staying in bed. So we use people rather than side rails in most settings. Now that is a job you can actually apply for right now. On most hospital websites, you will see them as sitter positions or patient safety attendant. Hold on, let me write it down. Patient safety down. attendant. And you guys are all eligible to work as a patient safety attendant right now. And that way, if you get in and you get hired and you start working as a patient safety attendant, once you get your certification, you just tell your nurse manager, hey, I'm a CNA now. It's a great way to transition into a CNA role. Okay, so that's what I searched on what website. I just go on to any like hospital. Okay. So if you go on to your favorite search engine and type in Oak Hill Hospital Jobs, it will pull up. Oak Hill Hospital's website, you go to the website, click jobs or careers, and it will be listed there. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, not the trenches, guys. Oh, 
patient safety attendant. Yeah. So you need to understand that positioning rails are not side rails. Positioning rails are half rails. This will help the patient roll over in bed, sit up. It kind of helps with them with position, but it keeps the area where they swing their legs out to get out of bed free. This is a positioning rail, not a side rail. Old hospital beds like this, you'll see in some nursing homes, have two rails. A top rail, which is a positioning rail, but if you raise the bottom rail, it becomes a side rail. Okay, so you can see that on this uh, bed. This. Oops. Sorry, guys. Hold on. YouTube world. Okay. So this one is a positioning rail. Patient can still get out. No problem. But if I raise this one, I restricted their ability to get out by themselves. They would have to go through this small space or go down or climb over. This increased the likelihood of uh, injury. Okay. So these rails require a doctor's order. Probably won't even see them on the bed. Usually, um, oh, I forgot to put my thing on. Usually you won't see them on the bed. Um, if the, if we get a doctor's order for them, uh, maintenance has to come put them on the bed. All right. Side rails do not keep patients safe. They actually make them weaker since they're not moving around. They get weaker. We haven't helped them a bit. We actually can make somebody completely bed bound for the rest of their life by putting them in a bed and putting the side rails up. They may never recover from that because all it does is make them weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker because they're not using any of those muscles. Side rails do not help your patient. But in order to remain safe, the patient needs to be in the middle of the bed, the safety zone. Anytime they're out of the middle of the bed, they're at risk. So when we do these skills, we want to make sure that we never put our patients in the unsafe zones. So we never just roll them over. If we just roll them over, they're on the edge of the bed. Unsafe zone. So like here, if they're turned on their side, we want them to be in the middle of the bed after the turn. Now you do that without even thinking about it. When you turn over, you don't just roll onto the edge of the bed, you shift so that your bottom is still in the middle of your space after the turn. We're gonna do that with patients too, but we're gonna do it as a two-step process. We are going to ask them to scoot toward us and then we roll them onto their side. So after the roll, they're in the middle of the bed, facing away from you. Always turn a patient facing away from you. So we wanna roll them to the middle after the scoot. So scoot and roll. Scoot toward me, roll away. We always have the patient turn away from us and there's a couple reasons for that. Gravity will always try to pull them onto their back. As long as you're standing on the same side that gravity is gonna try to pull them back to, you can stop that from happening. If you turn the patient towards you and they started to roll away from you, there's not much you can do. You have to stretch all the way over the bed. You can injure your back. You can fall on the patient. It's not good. So we remain the patient behind, the patient's behind, but there's another reason. When you turn the patient toward you, you make them eye level with your crotch. That is not good at all. You never want to put a dependent, vulnerable patient who is not fully dressed and laying down eye level with your personal space. That can trigger, if your patient has anything that they've been a victim of, it can trigger it. Okay. All right. So let's talk about bed position. We have three different positions that uh, or three different adjustments our beds can make. Head of the bed can go up and down. Foot of the bed can go up and down. And the entire bed can go up and down. 
when we're working with patients, we can raise the bed up to a comfortable working height. Your bed controls right here. These are bed controls. You can see this bed goes up. And I can raise the bed to a comfortable working height so I don't have to bend, and that's perfectly okay. You can do it for the test. This bed raises, and when I say raises, I, it becomes like a bunk bed. It's still going. Yeah, it's still going. So that's as high as it'll go. And you can raise the bed to make it comfortable for you. That's not a problem. But the problem comes in when this person tries to get out of bed, that floor has never moved a day in their life. Every night that they went to bed and swung their legs out in the morning, they wake up, swing their legs out. The floor is always right where it le they left it. They're expecting that. They're expecting the floor to be at a certain place. If this person tries to get out of bed, is that floor where they left it? So they're going to fall. It's not because the bed is high. It's because we moved the floor. Make sense? So if you put the bed up to make it comfortable for you at the end of the skill, we need to put it all the way down. This is not enough. I can't say, okay, that looks good. You have to return that floor to where your patient last found it. Okay, good. Questions? Head of the bed doesn't matter. Sometimes you have to put the head of the bed up for certain skills, like mouth care. At the end of the skill, it's whatever the patient wants. Maybe they want to sit up and watch TV. Maybe they want to lay down and take a nap. Doesn't matter, whatever they want. Go to the bed. Doesn't matter, whatever they want. But the entire bed must be in the low position. Oops, wrong way. All right, so we want to keep our patient from lying on the bare mattress. We want to replace the sheet on one side of the bed at a time. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. Um, you want to remove the dirty bottom sheet and make sure you spread out the clean sheet and minimize wrinkles. We don't want wrinkles on the sheet because wrinkles can create bed sores. They're an area of pressure. We'll replace the top sheet and make some hospital corners. You want to make sure you loosen the sheet over the toes so it doesn't drag the feet down. And replace the pillowcase. Limit the time that the patient is without a pillow. So let me show you the video for this one because we're running low on time. We're going to get into blood pressure in just a few minutes. Um, what about, um, we're going to have to skip that. I'm going to take and put that into another Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to change your sheets. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. We'll start out with a barrier. I'm going to get a top sheet a bottom sheet, and a pillowcase, and a privacy blanket. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this blanket over you. This will help protect your privacy and keep you warm while we do this scale, okay? Okay. Okay, I'm going to spread this out. Can you hold that blanket in place? Yes. And I'm going to remove the sheet from the bed.
will place the sheet in dirty linen. Mr. Jones, can I get you to scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can you roll up so that you're on your side facing in that direction? Thank you. I'll remove the two corners of the sheet from this side of the bed. And I'm going to roll the soiled sheet in toward the patient tightly. I'm going to tuck it up underneath the patient all along the length of his body. Now I'll take the clean sheet, unfold it, spread it out on the mattress, and attach the corners. Now I'll roll the clean sheet toward me. We'll roll it so that it's tight with no wrinkles as we tuck it under the soil sheet. Okay, Mr. Jones, come on back onto your back. And I need you to scoot to the center of the bed, please. Thank you. Can you scoot toward me, please? And can you roll so that you're laying on your side facing away from me? Thank you. I'll now remove the sheet from the bed that was soiled, wrapping it into a ball. and I'll go place this in dirty linen. Now I'll unroll the clean sheet and secure the corners on the mattress. As I do so, I'll make sure to stretch the sheet so that it's flat and minimize the wrinkles that are underneath the patient. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you come back onto your back, please? And scoot to the middle. Thank you. I'm now going to place the top sheet over you. And I'll remove that bath blanket now. Roll it in a ball and place it in dirty linen. Now I'm going to secure the sheet. I'm going to lift the mattress and smooth the sheet down so that it's flat under the mattress on both sides. Now I'll make hospital corners by lifting the top edge of the sheet about a foot from the end of the mattress, straight up, it'll form a triangle. Everything else will get tucked underneath. I'll repeat that on this side. And I'll loosen this over his toes so he has some wiggle room. There, how's that, Mr. Jones? Perfect, thank you. Very good. I'm going to remove the pillow from under your head. I'll bring it right back. I'll remove the pillowcase, being careful not to allow it to touch my uniform, and lay the pillow on the overbed table. We'll place the pillowcase in dirty linen. I'll take the clean pillowcase and scrunch it up all the way to the edges. 
we'll put the tag side in, place the pillowcase on top of the tag side of the pillow, and pull the sides down. I'll now place the pillow under his head with the opening facing away from the door. How is that, Mr. Jones? Perfect, thank you. Are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please don't hesitate to call. Can I get you something like a magazine? No, thank you. Okay, I'm going to open your curtain and wash my hands. The barrier will be thrown away. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Any questions? That's why I like showing that video because it has a lot of camera angles, mm -hmm. things that you wouldn't get to see from here if I just demonstrated it live. Um, so pulling the, the sheets and stuff, is that like a big thing? Say that one more time, I'm sorry. Folding, like tucking sheets in? Yeah, you have to make hospital corner. You have to get the corners of the sheet. We don't want to touch the floor. So it's just getting the corners under the mattress. It doesn't have to be as pretty as I made it, but we want the corners of the sheet under the mattress so it's not likely to slip off the bed on the floor. Okay. All right. So let's go to page 56. This is on blood pressure. Again, I've taken the notes for you. So let's talk about what is blood pressure. We all are familiar with that term. Everybody knows, you know, blood pressure is a measurement. That you get it done in doctor's offices or in automated machines at Winn-Dixie, Walmart, whatever. But what exactly is it? What are we measuring? So I want to go over this very, very briefly. There's no state test questions on this, but it's important that you have kind of a general understanding to understand how to take a blood pressure. So in the, uh, on the left side of our chest, we have a heart. That heart squeezes and pushes out a wave of blood. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That wave pushes the one in front of it. And that one pushes the one in front of it. We saw this with pulse. You guys remember that? With pulse, we put our fingers on the artery and counted the waves as they moved through. Blood pressure, we're not counting waves. That's what pulse is for. With blood pressure, what I want to know is how much pressure is inside this artery when the wave is moving through and how much is inside the artery in between the waves. So as the heart squeezes and pushes out that wave, that's telling us the heart is contracting. When the heart is resting in between waves, that's what the valley is. So contraction, rest, contraction, rest, contraction, rest. I want to know pressure, pressure. That's what a blood pressure is. The top number is the amount of pressure inside the artery when the heart squeezes. The bottom number is the amount of pressure inside the artery when the heart is at rest. Okay. So systolic is our top number or when the heart is squeezing diastolic is the bottom number or when the heart is at rest. Normal values, normal. If the top number or systolic is somewhere between 100 and 119, we consider that normal. The diastolic or bottom number, if it's between 60 and 79, we consider that normal. Anything over this, or under it would need to be reported. Anything over this or under it would need to be reported. So if I get 116, is that normal for the top? Yes. yes. So 100 to 119 is normal. So 116, if I got a top number 116. Yes. So do I have to report it? No. no. If I got a top number of 142. Yes. Report it. Okay, is that normal? No. 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 If I got a top number of 84, yes. report, it. report it. 
If I have a bottom number of 72, 60 to 79 is normal. If I have a bottom number of 72, is that normal? Yes. If I have a bottom number of 94, is that normal? No. Mm -hmm. If I have a bottom number of 56, is that, num is that normal? No. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether the abnormal is on the top number or the bottom number or both. They would need to be reported. Okay, questions? All right, so I'm gonna give you a brief overview. We're gonna get into this in detail in just a second, but a brief overview of taking your blood pressure. Everybody's had your blood pressure taken at some point, right? Right, so we got this gauge that they're looking at. We inflate the gauge and then the needle slowly comes down and they listen through a stethoscope. They hear whatever they're gonna hear and the needle gets to zero and they take that cuff off. Okay, from a patient point of view, that's your experience, right? Mm -hmm. Cuff goes on, needle goes up, needle comes down, cuff cu comes off. So I'm going to tell you what they are listening to. They're using a microphone. We call it a stethoscope. But they're using a microphone to listen to these waves hitting the top of the artery. So they inflate up to somewhere between 160 and 180. That's as far as we go as CNAs. That's our stopping point. We deflate slowly, and we're not going to hear anything. It's going to be quiet. Quiet, 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 quiet. What we're listening for is our first thump. Ideally, it should happen somewhere between 100 and 119, somewhere in here. Should be our first thump. We're, we're going to inflate all the way up to here. Slowly deflate. And we shouldn't hear anything. Nothing, 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 thump. Where the needle is, when we hear that first thump, the number that it's pointing to is our top number. We're going to hear more thumps. Thump, 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 thump. And then where we hear the last thump is our bottom number. Okay. Good. <laughs> For some reason, when we just went on the break, we were messing with our stuff. I was like, "Yeah, you go to two sixty. Like you push it to two sixty. No, don't <laughs> ever go to two sixty. <laughs> no, and don't inflate your cuff unless it's wrapped around something, because you can you can destroy your cuff that way. Oh. It's got to be wrapped around something. Okay. So let's talk about our equipment. We have two pieces of equipment. We have a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope. So two pieces of equipment. We have to learn how to use both of them. Chances are, if you play with it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Chances are, if you've played with your blood pressure cuff and stethoscope, you're doing it wrong. So if you've got a blood pressure cuff and stethoscope with you, go ahead and pull it out. And it's very, very important that you stay with me. Do not skip ahead. You need to stay with me as I show you everything I have to tell you. We're gonna we're we're gonna talk about that. Just hold up. <laughs> I'll get there. All right. So let's talk about the blood pressure cuff first. This thing. There's lots of parts to a blood pressure cuff. You have the cuff itself that has some Velcro, and that's how it holds together. Velcro is super, super strong. You have a fabric tab, which is where your gauge is going to sit. You have a little um, patch on it that's going to show you right arm or left arm with some arrows. Or it could just be a line with a circle. Go ahead and open. Go ahead. Get it done at once. Don't put anything together yet. I need your focus up here. Okay? We're going to put them all together in just a minute. We have two tubes coming off of our blood pressure cuff. One of them is going to let air in and out. The other one measures the pressure of that air. 
So one of your tubes is going to lead to a gauge. That's how we know the how much pressure. The other of the tubes is going to attach to a ball and valve. Okay, good. All right, so you've got your blood pressure cuff. If this isn't attached, it just plugs into one of your tubes, doesn't matter which one. So if you have to um, uh, assemble your bulb, plugs into one of your tubes, your gauge plugs into the other one. It doesn't matter which is which. They both go to the same bladder. Okay, so you just plug them in. All right, anybody else need to be assembled? Everybody good? All right. This gauge, this gauge is super heavy. It's got some prongs on the back. We don't just kind of hang it in place and hope for the best. If this falls off and hits your patient wrist, it will shatter it. We have to make sure that this is attached to our cuff firmly every time we put it on and take it off. So that's what this tab is all about. If you press down on the bottom of the clip, the top magically opens. And you slide it up that tab and that's where it lives. It won't ever fall off. What's that? All right, so this part, the bulb and valve assembly, is what's going to put air into the cuff and take air out of the cuff. This cuff is designed to direct the pressure in the bladder, that air bladder. We're putting air in by squeezing this. It's designed to direct that air pressure inward to squeeze your muscles, okay? So if we don't have this wrapped around something when we're inflating that balloon, it has nothing to put pressure against, which can cause your gauge to become uncalibrated and it can actually burst that air bladder in here, ruining your cuff. So when we're practicing, we have to make sure this cuff is wrapped around something when we're inflating and deflating. Got it? Mm -hmm. The quickest way to ruin a blood pressure cuff <coughs> is to play with it when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have a bulb and valve assembly. This is how we're going to control the air that goes into and comes out of our cup. Remember, do not squeeze this until it's wrapped around something. I'm going to pass some things around in just a few minutes and we'll work on it together. Right now, I want to show you the mechanics. Okay. When you hold this bulb in your hand, you should hold it so that silver dial is facing you and the tube is coming up the top. This is not correct. This is correct. Okay. Good. Questions? When you hold that dial in between your thumb and finger, righty tighty, lefty loosey. So we're going to turn that dial all the way to the right until it stops, but don't over tighten it because we have to loosen it in just a second. So just until it stops. And then we would inflate the cuff using the bulb, which we're not going to do yet. And then we're going to hold on to that little metal dial and turn it ever so slightly to the left, lefty loosey, to let some air out, okay? So this is the valve that opens and closes. When you're holding that, you should not let go. Because if I'm holding this and I open it a little and let go, when I go to grab it again, it's going to adjust. It's going to move, and I don't want that. 
So once your fingers go on this valve, they should stay on this valve. And that's how we get a nice, slow, smooth needle descent. And we want smooth. So once that dial is closed, we'll squeeze our bulb. We're going to stop pumping when we hit 160 to 180. CNAs do not go over 180. Not our domain. CNAs do normal. normal. If we have a patient whose blood pressure is over 180, is that normal? No. Do CNAs do not normal? No. Whose problem is this? No. Yeah, not us. CNAs stop at 180. If you get a high blood pressure, and we know it's higher than 180 because we heard it right away. Remember the first thump we hear is our top number. If we're hearing thumps right away at 180, we know the top number is somewhere above that. We don't need to know what it is. It's still a problem. Not our job to figure out how big of a problem. It's a problem. We report all problems to the nurse. Got it? So how high do we go? Anything more than that hurts. 180 hurts. But anything more than that really, 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 really hurts. And what do you think pain does to blood pressure. Makes it go up on yeah, it does. So if we inflate all the way up to 260 and hurt the patient and we deflate the cuff and we're listening for our first thump and our first thump shows up at 180, that's high blood pressure. But is it high because we hurt them? Maybe. We don't know. So we don't go past 180 you'll influence the blood pressure if you do. Negatively influence the blood pressure. Good? Good? All right. So this graphic is going to show you what's happening inside the body when we're doing this. Okay, so we have an arm. The arm should always be supported and it should be palm up. I drew this wrong, but it should be palm up. Okay, supported on the table. We put the cuff on and notice it's above the elbow, above the, don't have the cuff hanging out way down here. We want it above the elbow, like where your shirt sleeve ends should be the bottom of the cuff. If I have a microphone right here and I've got it on, people will hear me fine. What happens if I cover that microphone? Yeah, it muffles it or flattens the sound. When you put a stethoscope underneath the cuff, stethoscope is a microphone, you're flattening or deadening the sound. You're not going to be accurate with what you hear, okay? So we have a cuff that's put on the upper arm and that cuff, I, I kind of took the cuff away so you can see the artery here. That cuff, when we inflate it, when we put air in it, is going to push all that air in. And what that does is it closes off that artery. It's what we are trying to do. We're closing off that artery using the pressure from the air. Everybody with me? And then we're going to, so we're up here at 180 and our artery is closed because of the pressure pressing in. And then we're going to slowly deflate. Okay. While that cuff has closed off that artery, the heart is still beating. Better be, otherwise we've got bigger problems. And that means that each one of these waves is the heart beating and putting another wave in line. So right now our artery is closed. We've got some waves hanging out waiting to get through, but it can't because the artery is closed. So as we start to deflate by turning that dial counterclockwise very slowly, that needle is going to start to come down. We want it to move slow and smooth like a second hand going in reverse. As we do that, the air deflates from the cuff and the artery starts to open. You guys get that visual? Okay, as that artery opens, we have our stethoscope there, which is a microphone. We're gonna be listening right over the artery. So as that needle comes down, the cuff deflates, our artery opens, we're listening. Because as we're listening, remember those waves? It's hard to see here. We got some waves here. 
The waves are starting to make their way through because the artery is open enough that the waves can go through. But it's not wide open yet. So as those waves go through, they actually hit the top of the artery. And when they hit the top of the artery, they make a thunk sound. And that's what we're listening for. The first thunk sound is the point where the artery is wide enough that the first one was able to go through. Whatever number that is, is our top number. Well, if the first one made it through, others are going to make it through. So we're going to hear more thunks. Thunk, 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 thunk. Where the needle is when we hear that first thunk is our top number. We're going to learn how to read this style in just a minute. We're going to hear more thunks. And eventually, see how that artery got wider, right? Because the pressure decreased. So eventually, if you look at these waves, they're not hitting the top of the artery. What made the thunk sound? Yeah, a wave hitting the artery. If the wave isn't hitting the artery, are we going to get thunks? No, so our thunks go away. So where we hear the last thunk is our bottom number. So we inflate, we hear nothing, 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 thunk. Where the needle is when we hear that first thunk, top number. We'll hear more, thunk, 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 don't care about them. Where we hear the last thunk is our bottom number. And then we will hear no more after that. So we're looking for the first thunk and the last thunk. Okay, good. Questions? Okay, so that's the bottom number of the blood pressure. And then we're going to keep deflating until our needle hits zero and take the cuff off and record our reading. So to recap, we inflate, we deflate where the needle is, the number is 22 when we hear the first thunk. That's our top number. Normal is between 100 and 119. Remember, we started out way up here at 180. That means if our blood pressure is normal, we're not going to hear anything until we get way down here. So quiet, 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 thunk. That's important for you to know because your brain will try to talk you out of this. Your brain will say, I'm not hearing anything, not hearing anything. What's going on? Am I doing this right? Tell your brain to shut up and just listen. Okay. You will hear nothing at first. Now, if you inflate up to 180, remember I said the top number is where we hear our first thunk, right? If you inflate up to 180 and you start hearing thunks right away, our top number is 180, where we hear the first thunk. It could be way higher than that. We don't need to know. We just need to go find a nurse. That's enough to get their attention. Okay. So as we deflate, the number where we hear the last funk is our bottom number. And then it will be quiet. So now we need to learn how to read the dial. Okay, we're going to read the numbers. Everybody with me so far? Have I lost you yet? Okay, so large lines represent tens. So your 20s are already marked on the dial, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. The large lines in between are tens. So if this is the line for 80, that makes that 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. Okay, large lines are tens. Small lines are twos. So if this is the line for 140, this one is 142, 144, 146, 148, 150. There is no line for odd numbers. You cannot point at 157 on this dial. There's no line for it. So for blood pressures, when we're taking manual blood pressures, we should be reporting even numbers. Automated devices can do odd that's fine. Their machines are way more accurate than we are. Because when we're taking a blood pressure, we have to think about all the things involved here. Our hand has to inflate and deflate the cuff. So my hand is working. My ears have to listen for the first thunk and the last thunk. My eyes have to see on the dial where I heard the first thunk 
and where I heard the last song. My brain has to figure out what number that line represents. There's a whole lot going on here, guys. You are not as accurate as a machine with blood pressure. So stick to even numbers. Okay? If you give me an odd number, I know you're guessing. Every RN knows. If you tell me the blood pressure is 117 over 85, I know you don't have a clue what the blood pressure is. So at least you're guessing, you should say even number. <laughs> so that's not a good idea. I didn't say that, but I'm telling you, if you give me an odd number, I know you're guessing. Because you are not nearly that accurate. I am not nearly that accurate. Okay. So we're going to inflate slowly to one six or inflate up to 160 to 180. We're going to deflate slowly and smoothly all the way to zero. Along the way, we're listening for the first thunk and the last clear thunk. So if we're looking at this and we inflated all the way up here to 180, and I know it's kind of hard for some of you to see, we inflated all the way up and we deflated and it was quiet, 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 quiet. And this is the point the needle was at when we heard the first thump. This is 100. That's 102, 104, 106. So what is this guy's top blood pressure number? Okay. As it was going down, we heard more thunks. Thunk, 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 thunk. And then it kind of died out here. This was the last one that we heard. This is the line for 60, so 62, 64, 66. 66. So this guy's blood pressure is 106 over. 66. And we're going to deflate all the way to zero. Mm -hmm. okay. And the blood pressure we would record is 106 over 66. 66. Is that normal? Yes. Yeah. Is it not 120 over 81? It's always a range, always a range. So 100 to 119. So that means 120 is actually outside of normal. So it should be recorded. Yeah, they actually adjusted the values downward about five years ago, gave something like 14 million people in the country high blood pressure overnight because the, the, it used to go up to 140 was considered normal and they lowered it to under 120. So people that used to be considered normal are now diagnosed with high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Do you know how they, like, is there any readings or anything of why they figured that out? Um, it was done by the American Heart Association and it was based on studies and research and all of that. So it could always go down, like they could always change again? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, I, while you do your stuff, I do these questions. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten there yet. I know, but I don't know if like I'm a little slow or what, but I don't think I'm doing this right. Okay, we're going to do them together in just a minute. Okay. okay. So now let's talk about the stethoscope. We've got the blood pressure cuff done. Let's look at the stethoscope. So the large flat side of your stethoscope, this area here, is called a diaphragm. Some of you have a single diaphragm, others, so a single, which looks like, like this, right? So just one side. The others have discs on two sides, or like this one has a diaphragm and a bell, but two sides, okay? If it's two-sided, we have to tell the stethoscope which side we want to use right now. And as CNA is doing blood pressure, we are going to use the larger diaphragm, okay? The larger diaphragm, which is this one, not this one. When you're looking at your stethoscope, if it has two sides, it probably has a little dot on it. That dot tells you which side is currently being used. So this whole thing, turns. The whole head turns. So you want the large diaphragm to face the same direction as the dot. Okay. Large diaphragm faces the same direction as the dot. 
So if you need to, if yours looks like this, if your small area is on the same side as the dot, turn the whole thing. That's crazy. Okay. Now let's talk about ear tips. So let's talk about ear tips now. Ear tips are what transmits the sound to your ears. Ear tips are attached to ear pieces. Okay, we need these to be transmitted to your ear drums to pick up the sound. Remember, we're listening to a wave of blood hitting the top of an artery. <coughs> Not much there, okay? So we need to understand that your ear, your ear canals are not straight. So if you look at this, they're pretty flat, right? Pretty straight. Some of yours are pre, can you hold yours up? Pre turned. Those of you, yours too. Those of you who have straight ear pieces, we need to adjust these to look more like what the others look like. So if you hold, see here, we got to have them slightly curved. If you hold, what is it? <laughs> there we go. If you hold down here at the chin strap and take your other hand, you can actually move these to a more curved position. So do you see that? That's what your ear tip should look like. Hold on, I'm gonna come around to each person. So yours, we're going to turn like this. Yours are preset, preset, uh, preset. There you go. Yours are good. Yours are good. I didn't hear what you. Yours are good. So, yeah, maybe just not quite that much. Probably something like that. Thank you so much. Yours are already preset. Let me just a little bit. There you go. Excuse me. I'm going to turn these just a little bit. Okay. All right. Hold on, guys. Don't get ahead of me. Remember I said don't get ahead of me, right? you got to stay right where I'm at because you're not putting your ear tips in right. Okay? There's a right and wrong way to put these in your ears. So now that we have our ear tips facing in a slightly curved direction, they go into your ears facing forward, not like this, <clears throat> facing forward. So your ear tips face forward, forward, not like this. They don't face you. They face forward. Turn yours all the way around. Just, just flip the whole thing. No, just, look, watch. Flip the whole thing. There you go. Okay. So your ear tips should be facing away from you. Put them in your ears and then tap your stethoscope. Okay. You see that? Now flip them back around so they're facing you the wrong way. Put them in and tap your stethoscope. Turn them the other way so they're wrong. Take them out, flip them. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Do you see that you can't hear when they're backwards? Yeah. I definitely felt a difference. Okay. I thought I was broke for a second, but I guess. That yeah, and that's why I said that we'll get to that in just a few minutes because everybody thinks the same way. We have nurses that come in and buy stethoscopes and come back and bring them back and say it's broken. I do this and hand it to them, and they're like, oh, it works. <laughs> your stethoscope has to face away from you, and your diaphragm needs to be in the right position for it to work. Okay? Good? That's why I said I need you to stay with me. Okay? So now I need to, um, this is a common error. You won't be able to hear the blood pressure though. So we're going to inflate 
We're going to deflate. We're listening for the first thump and the last clear thump. We're going to use our stethoscope to listen. But we need to be over the artery. Remember, we're listening for a wave of blood hitting the top of an artery. We have to be <coughs> over the artery to know, you know, to be able to hear it. So your artery is not where you think it is. So we're going to find the brachial artery. Remember with pulse, we looked at the radial artery. Now we're going to find the brachial artery. So if you hold your arm out and pop that elbow all the way up, don't let it get lazy. If your elbow gets lazy, you're not going to feel it. Pop that elbow, take two fingers right at the bend. It's on the pinky side. Remember with radial pulse, we were on the thumb side. This one is on the pinky side. So if you put two fingers at the fold of the elbow, more on the pinky side, and put your thumb on the back, you should feel your thumbs. Do you find it? You're, you're quite a bit in the middle. It's usually a little bit more on the pinky side. You want to be a little bit more on the inside. No, we don't want to go up. We want to go here, oh, not here, pinky, right here. and you really want to be on those lines. So you want to come down a little bit because you've got a lot of tissue there. We want the thinnest area. So right here, put your thumb on the back. Put your thumb on the back. It's easier if you take your jacket off. Oh, yeah. you find it? Yeah. Find it? Yeah. You find it? Yeah. You find it? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> so I need you to get your arms straight. Straight, 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 straight. We're going to put our fingers right there. Put your thumb on the back. Yes. Okay. Did you guys find it? Yes. Everybody find it? I keep finding it and losing it, but I'm finding it. Okay. So take your fingers, find your pulse. Keep your fingers on it. Once you find your pulse, let your elbow relax a little bit and see what happens. It goes away. Bring your elbow back up. Okay. So when you're trying to find the pulse on the patient, what position does their arm need to be in? Straight. If it's relaxed even a little bit, you're not going to feel it. You're not going to feel it. But we need to know where the artery is to put our stethoscope there. Okay. So can I borrow you? Yep, come on up here. All right, so this is how this whole process works. I'm going to show you how the whole process works. Your patient will be sitting. Their arm will be supported on the table, not hanging out in midair. So can I just have you support your arm on here for me? Right? I'm going to lay this on their arm. Remember, it has to be above the elbow, not down here. Up here, I'm going to find the artery. It's right there. I'm going to line up that arrow with where I feel the artery. And now that arrow tells me where to put my stethoscope. Kind of like an X marks the spot. I'm going to secure the cup. And I'm going to put my ear tips in facing away from me. I'm going to put the stethoscope on the skin, not under the cuff, on the skin over the artery. And I really want to smush it down. Good contact. I'm going to take this, close it off, ready, tidy, inflate up to 180. Okay, somewhere between 160 and 180. And then I'm ever so slightly going to turn this dial just a little bit. So that needle comes down and I should be listening. There it is. I'm hearing more. And it ended. So I'm going to open all the way. So my needle goes to zero. Take that out. And take this off. Thank you. That's how we take a blood pressure. Okay, you are not going to be accurate today. You are not going to be accurate this week. I will not double check anybody's reading. 
because you're not accurate. I know you're not accurate. It takes about 45 blood pressures to even start to get accurate. You are not accurate today. You are not accurate this week. 45 blood pressures to really start to dial this in. Because as I'm listening, I'm hearing my fingers creak. I'm hearing the tubes rub together. I'm hearing people make noise in the room. It's a microphone. It amplifies everything. You have to figure out how to disregard that information and zero in on what we're trying to listen to, the thunks, okay? So I want you to break up into groups of two, take their blood pressure and let them take yours. You three will have to work together because there's a group of two. No, you don't have to write it down. I just want you to get used to the process. Put the cup on. Put your earpieces in, inflate, deflate, and listen. Remember, you're not going to be accurate. Make sure the arm is supported. Yeah. Where's the arrow? Oh. Oh, I see. It says left arm, right arm. Right. So I want to do it on the before we secure this, I want to find her artery. Oh, right. So And then we can secure straight. Okay. And now we'll put our stethoscope here. Your piece is facing out. And you're not going to hear anything yet. It's going to be over here. Remember, oh, you're, side. Side. you're not going to hear anything yet. You need to inflate. We're going to go up. And then we're going to deflate. And somewhere over here. Oh, there's a arrow right there. Oh, there's an arrow I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. Keep going. Keep going. 116 over. I want to try to feel through your arteries. Oh my god. I just started sweating. <laughs> this is hard. This is hard. Yeah. This is hard. Keep opening. You have to keep opening the whole time. Remember, you have to keep opening the whole time. Yep. I am here. So, I was to on the line. I I so, 
So I want to make sure that you get it. So it's okay. Appreciate it. And you have to do it. Oh, Because I can feel it. Right so you're in the right area. And then Okay, so I'm not Obviously, I'm wrong, but the first time I got the Okay. Yeah, I'm closer to the right. Okay. I get that. Mm -hmm. I heard Okay, go ahead and finish up the one you're working on. Because for over time. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, she's like, I don't get paid for this. <laughs> oh no, I, I I have no problem with you staying. I just uh, I know people have work and and other obligations. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Did everyone hear at least one good set of thoughts? I know you didn't. I didn't. Did everybody hear at least one good set of thoughts? Oh, yeah. You didn't hear anything? I think it was too much going on in too the loud in the class. Do you got are you familiar with the process to be able to go home and practice? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So when you go Turn it all the way to the left, your little silver dial. No, it's not closed. Oh, no, other, way. other way. Other <laughs> way. Other way. There you go. All the way. All the way. Until it stops. You also need to turn your stethoscope the other way. I know, I get you. Um, yeah, it's, it looks like they're pointing backward. Mm -hmm. Push it down hard. No, no, turn the whole thing. There you go. Okay, before you come back to class, I would like you to do the questions on page 57 in the gray box. There's a couple of blood pressure samples there. It shows you where the first and last thump showed up. So you can get used to reading the dial and selecting the numbers. Okay? Practice is the name of the game here, guys. There's no way around it. We have to practice this. And I know we don't have a lot of time in class. We will have more practice time in class starting next week. Monday, we'll have about a half hour at the end of class just for practice. Wednesday, we're going to have about an hour at the end of class just for practice. So starting next week, we have practice time built in. But I have to get all of this instruction to you before I start letting you practice so that you're practicing the right way. Okay? So open the wrap-up email. Remember, the link will be in there for today's lesson. Um, you can watch the replay. And if you haven't already, make sure you accept the invitation to join the online course because I have a lot of really useful activities in there that will help you with this. Um, and then uh, next class is going to be on, my, uh, on Wednesday at 9. So here's your review sheet for today. Here's the review sheets for today. You can pick it up. Um, can you take one and pass it, please? Welcome. All right, those of you joining us from Virtual World, you can access these review sheets on um, courses.4yourcna.com in the first lesson. You'll see all the replays available and the worksheets. So are the worksheets helping you guys summarize what we go over in class? Yes. Yes. I'm actually, and I have the flashcards too. Yeah. Good, very good. And you know, the first, first two pages of the class, I did it, whatever, and my friend came over, she started, like, questioning me about them, and I was answering them, and I was like, you have to tell about the answers. And she was like, the answers are at the bottom, and I was like. <laughs> yep, the answers are at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. But it's good that you didn't know that was very true. Right. right. You know it's there. Right. All right. I hope you guys have a fantastic day. I will see you on Wednesday. Until next time, have caregiving. Oh, one more thing real quick. I totally forgot. Tomorrow is the game show at 11 a.m. live on YouTube. You can compete for prizes. We give away a card game. We give away a four-year CNA badge holder, um, keychains and bracelets, and all kinds of really cool motivational stuff. So if you join us tomorrow at 11 on YouTube, you can compete in YouTube to win prizes. Okay, so tomorrow at 11 on YouTube, live.
All right, YouTube world, happy caregiving. Bye. Bye.